On behalf of Administrator Cordman and Associate Administrator Jeff Weiss, I'd like to welcome you to today's forum. Today's topic is managing cracking uh, challenges in pipelines. Um, you know, forums such as this are extremely important to us at the Office of Pipeline Safety as a key part of our program to transfer knowledge to the public and to the industry, our stakeholder community. Uh, through forums like this, we're able to impart knowledge on what is going on on a particular topic. Today's topic related to cracking and pipelines is one that's very relevant for right now, and a lot of good work has been done over the last couple of years, as you'll see demonstrated by the panels and the discussions that you'll hear uh, in a moment. Um, and we thought the timing was right to bring a lot of this information out that perhaps some of you or many of you have not seen before. And just to show you where the progress that's been made on this particular topic. Um, but anyway, I thought I'd go through a couple of housekeeping uh, items obligatory before we get started. And by the way, as a reminder, this meeting is being webcast. I'd like to welcome our webcast participants. Uh, there is an opportunity for you to be involved as well. And of course, this is a good way for, you know, to webcast events like this to get the widest participation of people uh, out there in the pipeline in industry, but there'll be an opportunity certainly for you to get involved and ask questions uh, as over the course of the, uh, the day today. Uh, first off, we have an agenda there, or if you don't have one, they're out on the front desk. Um, and of course, we have uh, members from industry and vendors and regulators who will give a variety of perspectives on the issue of, of cracking. And by the way, the issue we're talking about here related to cracking or crack-like defects is specific to steel pipelines. We're not dealing with plastic or distribution um, type pipelines today. It's, it's specific to steel. Although uh, within a distribution system, although you may have transmission systems or pipelines that uh, obviously this information would be relevant for those of you who operate transmission systems and distribution systems, but not uh, the plastic version of pipelines. You know, I'd just like to thank everyone who's uh, participating today. I know uh, the people here today have a day job, a lot of things going on, just dealing with the issues we're actually talking about today. So it's very much appreciated that people are taking the time to come here and, and help uh, in this important topic. Um, the agenda, of course, this morning, right after um, I do my part, we'll have a perspective from Robert Hall with the National Transportation Safety Board, and then we'll follow that with uh, U.S. and state regulators. Uh, and then we'll have lunch. Um, we'll go straight into the first panel, and then we'll have lunch. Uh, we do have a list of uh, restaurants that are local on the front desk. Uh, when you check in, if you see Kelly, she'll provide you a list at the front. Um, there are a variety of places nearby. And then the, uh, in the afternoon, we'll have additional perspectives. You can see it all in the agenda. It's fairly detailed. Um, and then I'll wrap it up at the very end. I'll be back to wrap up and adjourn uh, around the 4.30 time frame. Let's see. And then uh, as far as where we're going to put the information you'll see today, we will have it put on our website. It will be posted uh, within a week. Uh, as well as the audio recording will be available at a later date as well for this webcast. So if you know people in your office who perhaps have missed it, have wanted to uh, see today's webcast, it, there will be an opportunity to pick mm -hmm. that up off, the, uh, off our website there. You can also follow us on Twitter, um, and that information is shown right there. I know I'm not a big uh, tweet person, but I know uh, it's kind of a newer means to communicate via social media, and that's uh, one of the methods that we're communicating about this forum today. Uh, there will be plenty of opportunity for questions, we, we anticipate, at the end of each panel. So uh, we have a floor mic here, one in the middle, uh, and then there's also an opportunity, if you prefer, there'll be cards. Uh, the cards are at the front desk. We'll make sure that a couple of us have those, and if you would prefer to write that question down, please. Um, Please, by all means, do so. Also, for the webcast uh, participants, there's an opportunity for you to also submit a um, question by email, and that uh, the link is located within the uh, screen that you have with your webcast right now. If by chance you have an issue with that, please uh, email uh, Mr. Smith directly if there are any issues that you see with that. But that should be. We haven't had any issues with that in the past, so please. Um, Use that by all means and participate if you're webca on the webcast. 
As far as emergency exits go, um, there is one. The door you came in is the door to go out. Um, I guess it looks like I'll be the last one out of this room today. But yeah, you'll go um, out that door and to the left or to the right and to the exits to the outside. Uh, restrooms, uh, the closest ones really, if you go out to my right, um, and they're on your left uh, down the hallway. Uh, related to cell phones, please put them on vibrate if you haven't done so uh, now or turn them off. Uh, also related to name tags, uh, you should have received your name tag at the sign-in uh, desk up front. Uh, these are, if you're also attending our R&D workshop, this will be your name tag for that as well. So please save it for that if you're going to stick around for that, that workshop. Um, and then just again, thank you. I'd like to, you know, especially thank a couple of people who uh, were instrumental in, in uh, helping us prepare for today. Certainly with Enbridge, Walter Kresick and Lorna Heron. Um, Ian Calhoun, our, our friend from Canada by way of Scotland is here today. We we'll appreciate his help as always. And then of course our um, just advocacy groups uh, such as API, INGA, uh, NGA NYSEARCH, and PRCI. Certainly we, we appreciate your assistance as always, especially when it came to uh, trying to get uh, a good panel of speakers. And I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, I think we do have a very knowledgeable, uh, worthy panel uh, to help represent the industry on this important topic today. So very much appreciate the, the work there. And with that, um, it's not time for break yet, but <laughs> what I thought I would do, uh, good try, Bob. Um, <laughs> what I thought I would do is uh, we'll start off uh, getting a perspective from uh, the National Transportation Safety Board. As you know, uh, NTSB um, is involved in investigating a number of pipeline failures. There have been a number over the past few years where they have investigated that have involved the issue that we're talking about today. And Robert Hall, who's the director of the um, Pipeline and, and Railroad Division, will bring a perspective on that. So without further ado, I think I'll just turn it right over to you, um, Rob. Thank you, Alan. Uh, as Alan said, I'm the director of the Office of Railroad Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Investigations. Uh, at the NTSB, I have the distinction of having the longest job title. Um, in my talk this morning, what are you looking for? And this is a, a question to think about. What are you looking for? Because we have many examples in the history of NTSB investigations dealing with ILI where people didn't know what they were looking for, missed opportunities. The NTSB investigations, we look at catastrophic accidents, so we're always looking at the worst of the worst. Uh, fortunately, in the pipeline world, that's not a lot, but it's still too many. Our investigations are comprehensive. Uh, we put enormous amount of effort into the investigations we do. In San Bruno alone, we had more than 20,000 man hours of investigation in the San Bruno uh, accident. And this allows us to look at issues much deeper than any other investigation that occurs. We also take a retrospective look. In San Bruno, we went back to the 1949 construction documents from Battelle. And they had information that was valuable in the investigation. We found in those 1949 documents histories of seam problems. Yet, in the end, in San Bruno, the method to inspect was chosen to be direct assessment, even though there was documented history of seam problems. And lastly, our investigations connect the dots. We connect the dots from the beginning you know, back to the construction, all the way up to the failure, and what the, the, uh, what the connections are there and what they mean to us. So I've look, taken a number of investigations. I, I started for this uh, talk and pulled out my Marshall talk, and I, after thinking about it, I said, you know what? Everybody in this room probably knows 
a lot of details about Marshall uh, because that's that's what resulted in our most recent round of recommendations. I think that they had a, uh, a start here in this workshop uh, answering part of the Marshall question. So I reduced Marshall down to two slides. Uh, beginning with, this is the failure. Uh, and this was the, the result of the operation and the inspection and the missed opportunity uh, that the inspection presented. And what we saw in Marshall that occurred just in 2010, uh, billion dollar cleanup, and the cleanup still continues. Enbridge had performed multiple inspections. There were many ILI inspections to draw from and look, look at. They had evidence of metal loss. They had evidence of cracks. But as we know, they weren't looking at the two items together. We also know that the ILI vendor identified the crack that ultimately failed in Marshall as a single crack. And had he identified it as a crack field, it would have taken a different evaluation. There was a missed opportunity. And the obvious one that the corrosion group that was looking at the general corrosion and the crack group didn't talk to each other. And we had these defects that lied on top of each other. The result was no excavation and a missed opportunity to prevent this accident from occurring. If we go back a year earlier, Palm City, Florida, unfortunately the NTSB didn't issue this report until after Marshall, Michigan. Uh, the, the consequences of this accident were somewhat less, but look at this picture. And what have we got? We've got corrosion and we've got cracks all in the same area. Occurred May 4th, 2009. One of the problems, misclassified as class one, left out of the high consequence areas, did not require inspection, but it was inspected anyway because there were HCAs on either side of it. And a 2004 MFL inspection identified corrosion. But there were other missed opportunities. The piping in this area had been replaced. Records could not be found on why it was replaced. So we had some sort of issue in the past that required replacement here. And the records were absent. Another missed opportunity. Also, we identified the, in this uh, investigation that the cause was near neutral stress corrosion cracking. Although the pipeline company in their analysis had decided that this area was not susceptible to that failure mechanism, another missed opportunity. And there was no excavation of the 2004 ILI results. And again, a failure. If we go back a little bit further, Chalk Point, Maryland. Here we have a wrinkle bend. This was in April 2000. Had a significant environmental impact. Had a significant political impact, being just a short distance from the capital and spilling heavy oil into the Chesapeake Bay. This resulted in a wrinkle bend that the ILI misidentified as a T-section. It's kind of remarkable that you misidentify it as a T-section. Can't you find that on your alignment sheets? Aren't T's shown on the alignment sheets? There was no cross-comparison back to the construction records. So we have this misidentified defect. They didn't know what it was. The ILI reader called it as a T-section. Again, no excavation, and we have a failure. Bellingham, Washington, going back a little bit further. In 1999, we have three fatalities here. There was third-party damage. ILI identified 
both met a loss and a dent at this location. But they didn't go back to the ILI records that were some 10 years earlier that didn't have a dent there. They had thought that this dent was a construction previously evaluated. They didn't go back, although they had records of the pipeline crossings, they didn't go back to see when those pipeline crossings were installed. And it was a water pipe that had been installed between those two ILIs that resulted in the dent of which there was metal loss and the ultimate failure. And again, there was no excavation. You know, what these four accidents show over the course of more than a decade is that the defects are often disguised. But the ILI in each of these cases told you something was there. Something was there to be identified. Yet, in each case, they were missed. What was there was unexpected. So what do we need to do? We need to expect the unexpected. We need to use all of the available information. It's not just the ILI. It's not just the ILI reader and his interpretation. We have to go back to the construction records. We have to look at the operation records. We have to understand all there is to know about what occurred at the location of the indication. We have to inspect comprehensively. You know, this is the big challenge. We have here, we're talking about crack management workshop. Crack detection is only the first step. There's so much more that needs to be done to go from the feature in the ILI to the excavation to the prevention of the next major accident. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. I appreciate those examples, too. I know, um, you know, as we describe and talk about this issue uh, from the Office of Pipeline Safety perspective, I know you'll hear some other examples as well. There are a lot that we know about that have occurred incident-wise in the last uh, few years, but there are a number that are less notorious that, um, you know, of course, some that uh, Mr. Hall pointed out, obviously, were, were quite well known during their time, but um, there are a number that, that we just haven't heard about that have occurred out there, too. So definitely some lessons learned. And, you know, we're all, or we should be all about continuous improvement, continuous learning, and that's what we're here for today is to, hey, look, this has been going on for a little while. What have we learned? Where are we and where do we need to go? So look forward to further discussion as we go forward there. Um, next, I will turn it over to uh, Ken Lee. Ken is our the FEMSA uh, OPS Director of Engineering and Research, and Ken will moderate the, the next panel uh, from the regulator perspective. Ken? Not sure where your slides are. Well, we're going to start off with Steve's okay, slides. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for your efforts to improve pipeline safety. I think it'd be useful to start our first panel with a overview from the unique per per perspective of the federal government. Uh, we will have the U.S. Uh, government, uh, FIMSA, uh, speak next, and then all, also from the Canadian side, the NEB. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Steve Nanny, who works uh, with FIMSA, and he's based in uh, Houston, Texas. It's a little different when you can't see see anybody in the audience when you, when you step up here. It, it makes you think you're in a movie theater and everybody's having popcorn and soda watching the movie. But anyway, I, I thank you for coming today. Uh, again, as Ken said, my name is Steve Nanny. I represent the uh, uh, FEMSA, and I'm here to talk about uh, 
uh, lessons learned. And the, the first thing, uh, if I can figure out where the uh, page down is, here it is, is, is I'm going to start with the conclusions rather than uh, going through a big long presentation to get to the conclusions. I'm just going to get there on the second slide. Our lessons learned usage. And, and I guess just like what uh, Robert said earlier, uh, whether it's a major or minor pipeline incident, uh, we've got to learn from all of it. Uh, integrity, operational, and response matters also. And take a proactive approach. In, in other words, uh, whether it's hydrostatic testing, replacements, uh, we've got to do the things to uh, eliminate potential in-service ruptures. And then the, uh, the last thing that Robert uh, touched on in his presentation is the uncertainty in the crack tools, the exa direct examination results. Uh, we need to make sure we don't rely too heavily on a pig and dig approach. In, in other words, we, we need to use hydrostatic testing also. And then we need to make uh, significant improvements uh, in uh, pipeline risk, ILI, and our direct assessments. Uh, we need to look at how the information from the direct assessments findings are used uh, in our programs. Going back since uh, 2002, uh, PHMSA has participated in over uh, 36 projects on crack detection of some sort. Uh, and that's uh, $18 million that's been invested. The project focus has been crack de detection, stress corrosion cracking, uh, selective seam well cracking or corrosion, crack arresters, crack growth rate models. And uh, when you checked in, you should have gotten a, uh, a handout that lists all the various uh, projects that PHMSA has invested money, uh, either solely or, or uh, in uh, participation with others. Uh, the PHMSA R&D program, some of the things that we've tried to concentrate on is uh, hydrostatic testing for the pipe scenes, enhanced IL, ILI detection and sizing. Uh, we've looked to establish performance and how to size the uh, seam anomalies and also uh, uh, whether it's a, a body cracking anomaly. And we've looked at developing models and, uh, and growth mechanisms to quantify them. And then, of course, to develop management tools. Lessons learned from from plus 20 years ago and the past four years. Well, well first of all, it, it started in 1988 and 1989, where there'd been 145 uh, ERW pipe seam uh, failures. And PHMSA came out with advisory notices in 88, 89, 1991. Then on cast iron pipe, you can see 91, 92. Uh, again, stress corrosion cracking in 2003, a cast iron distribution pipeline in 2012, and then a lessons learned that came out earlier this year. I guess the point is, is crack detection is not something that should be new in, in any of our shops. It should be something that, that, that we should have our arms around, and, and maybe we do not. The, uh, the NTSB uh, recommendation list uh, starting in, uh, in 2012 to 2014 is 62 recommendations in five years. Uh, we had 39 after San Bruno, and then we had, we've had 23 others since. Uh, lessons learned on steel pipe. What are the lessons learned? Are, are we using data integration? Are we using a conservative approach in sizing? How about tool tolerances? Do we go back and check to make sure the tools, whether it's an ILI tool or in the ditch tool, uh, to see what type uh, results we're getting? What are we looking at as far as interactive interaction of crack growth? Are we considering everything there? Material properties, toughness. Are we using the lowest toughness? Uh, whether it's the seam or whether it's in the body. Fatigue crack growth model, what are we using there to predict the remaining life? Are we using uh, the, the correct models? And then the combination of tools used, ILI, direct assessment, and pressure test. Are we using the, the correct combination of all of those? Are we just using one and forgetting about the others? And then continuous reassessment. If you have cracking issues, 
Are we doing a one and done? Are we looking at a periodic reevaluation? Lessons learned, cast iron pipe. Uh, again, uh, cast iron is uh, uh, one that's a little, little bit different uh, if it's in an unsatisfactory condition, uh, but no immediate hazard exists, we should initiate a program to recondition or phase out. Uh, general graphization found to a degree where fracture might result, we should replace. Pipe excavated must be protected from damage. And then for cast iron, uh, follow section 192.613, continuing surveillance, take appropriate actions, recondition and phase out, replace or reduce your operating pressure. Basic questions for crack detection. Where do you look? What do you look for? When do you look for it? How much do you look at? Do you look at one joint of pipe? Do you look at 10 joints of pipe? Do you look at 100% of the joints of pipe? How often do you look for it? And how do you assess it for a safe pressure? I think these are some of the key questions in crack detection, whether you're a, a, a vendor, service provider, whether you're an operator or a regulator. Our current world. Again, as, uh, as Robert uh, uh, went over in his uh, presentation, uh, San Bruno, Marshall, Michigan, Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, over in Mississippi where we had a scene crack, and then the latest one would be the Mayflower, Arkansas uh, issue. And then the, the other that we're seeing is uh, from time to time is uh, issues with new pipe. So we need to make sure that we were vigilant in that. High profile accidents from 2010 to 2014. Uh, again, we, we keep hearing them over and over, and I'm, I guess I'm going over them over and over. Uh, Marshall, Michigan, uh, San Bruno, California, Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Mayflower. Uh, all seem to have some type of cracking issue involved. Again, here's a picture from Mayflower. You can see in the uh, lower left-hand corner the uh, crack in the uh, uh, low-frequency ERW weld seam. And you can also see the uh, crude oil going by the homes. It was a, approximately a 5,000 barrel spill. The pipe was constructed in 1947-1948. Our current world, 2010 to 2014, uh, PHMSA is evaluating the need for new regulations. Uh, We've got the NTSB uh, investigations and their results, and we've got these 62 recommendations. We've got the reauthorization, which will include multiple new mandates. Uh, we've had audits and findings from them with directives of what to do. We've held workshops similar to this one over the past several years. And we've, held, we've conducted new studies related to the effectiveness of the current regulations, and we've seen in in various journals uh, pointing that we, we may or may not need new regulations, but they are coming. And then we've had the Secretary's call to action. Uh, and then the last, uh, last year we had a, a workshop on the gas rule, uh, the uh, uh, IVP, and uh, that draft rule is written and, uh, and being circulated. Lessons learned the past four years. Our lessons learned operational and integrity management and also have we learned lessons on new facilities in the design and our construction practices. Lessons learned for integrity management, the assessment results must be validated. We've got to do direct exams. We've got to have unity charts for ILI and data integration. On ILI tool findings, they must be based upon conservative characterization procedures. A direct in situ examinations of the crack length and depth, including pipe and seam toughness. In situ examinations must have protocols to ensure the accuracy of the equipment being used and that safe pressures are being calculated. And also uh, when the reassessments need to take place. I allow results for crack tools are based on what's recorded. If an anomaly is not detected or reported, the operator cannot assess the result. Do we need to go back and look at the technology and how we're using it? Lessons learned integrity management. The threats must be fully evaluated based upon the seam type, 
and the coating types, the operating and environmental and local conditions. On hydro testing, uh, they must be used to supplement inline inspection for crack detection and elimination. Uh, we've got to look at hydro, hydrostatic spike test, and they've got to be high enough uh, based upon the pipe yield to be effective. Uh, I think a lot of times we do a spike test, and, and I know FEMSA will see from an operator a 1.25 pressure test times MOP is a spike test. Uh, a spike test in FEMSA's definition is not a 1.25 times MAOP test or MOP. Uh, also, if one assessment tool does not fully assess the threat, multiple tools must and should be used. A crack in threats may require both ILI and hydro test and should. Lessons learned on new facilities. Uh, when we're designing and constructing new facilities, are we putting coatings on the pipe uh, that, that don't cause issues for stress corrosion cracking? How about the seam type? Are we looking at the manufacturing quality? Are we looking at the material that's being used, the, the welding and inspection, to make sure we're, we're not putting new pipe that may have some of the same issues as the old pipe? And then last on the field construction procedures, are we, are we testing high enough? Should we be testing at even higher pressures? Is a 1.25 uh, the correct pressure we should be using? Lessons learned. Does your company have a safety culture? I, I realize when we go and we talk about safety culture, we look at, at health and safety principles, life-saving rules and training and things like that. But also, are we looking at an integrated management system with continuous improvement? Does your executive management get involved beyond budgets? Do we have improved specifications and procedures based upon lessons learned? Uh, and, and I think here today with the uh, presentations that we'll be having, that will go back and look at a lot of companies of what they put in place. I think we'll see a lot of good lessons learned today. We'll also see from some of the ILI uh, vendors and some of the other uh, manufacturers what they're doing to improve quality so I, I think today will be very beneficial to see where we're going and and, and the next two days after this we'll be having the uh, R&D uh, forum so hopefully some of the things we learn here today we can implement the, the next two days as we go forward in that and then last uh, best practice practices uh, with a safety and integrity focus are we doing more than the DOT code minimums are we looking at all integrity threats? And again, are we using direct examination, hydro test, pipe replacements? Are we using everything in the toolbox? We need to use them all. And then again, to go back to my first slide is the conclusions. Lessons learned usage. Again, uh, we need to learn from major and minor incidents. We need to take a proactive approach and we need to make significant improvements in the, in the way we hydro test, the way we use ILI, and the way we use direct assessments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, we will answer your, your questions after our next speaker. Uh, for those on the webcast, feel free to send us your questions. And we'll be uh, keeping track of those and uh, bringing those out uh, during our question and answer session. Our, our next speaker is Ian Calhoun. Uh, he's chief en engineer with the National Energy, Energy Board of Canada. And we're pleased to welcome him here. Uh, he's traveling here from Calgary. Hey, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure and an honor to take part in the, uh, the, the work that's carried out by FIMSA. We have great regard for that kind of work north of the, of the border. Um, <clears throat> my boss thinks it's uh, particularly appropriate that I should represent the National Energy Board on cracking. 
although I think she has a neurological uh, context rather than a physical one. Uh, but she did go out of her way to actually articulate that thought. So um, <clears throat> I thought I'd pass that on to you. We're here talking about uh, position and perspectives. Well, of course, the National Energy Board's perspective on cracking is that there is cracking. And our position is that there ought not to be. Uh, with that simple thought, I'm going to torture you now with a, a short PowerPoint presentation that says just that. Uh, first of all, the uh, obligatory uh, discount, uh, whereby the lawyers of the National Energy Board say that whereas I might well be the, uh, in the, uh, the uh, chief engineer, they don't trust me to talk in public. <laughs> you know, it's not so bad. Uh, it really isn't. Once I've said this, I can say what the hell I like, right? Um, Cracking is a big issue to the National Energy Board. Now, it, it shows in this, um, this little pie chart here that it's some 36%. However, uh, the, the one that concerns us most as far as body cracks are concerned is uh, stress corrosion cracking, of course. We, ha we do have hook cracks, we do have welding uh, cracks as well, but a lot of the cracking we see is actually fatigue cracking of small fittings, nipples, and, and tubing, and the likes. So I had to bear that in mind when we're talking about it, but the main thrust for us uh, as part of my presentation today is going to be concerning the, the threat uh, associated with uh, stress corrosion cracking. If we have a little look at um, what the, the, the record shows for stress corrosion cracking, I can maybe jump a little bit ahead, and uh, around 1995, so uh, I think Alan said this work's been going on for a long time, continues, excuse me, continues, but uh, the historical perspective is, is important too. In uh, 1995, there was uh, an inquiry uh, conducted by the National Energy Board, and they reported in 1996. And one of the things that definitely happened was a significant drop, or apparent anyway, significant drop in uh, the number of ruptures related to stress corrosion cracking. So when we talk a little bit about the NEB initiatives and the, the industry initiatives that followed from that, um, <clears throat> there is physical evidence that uh, the, the, the industry is taking the, the threat seriously and is having significant successes. If we look at that uh, first part of the, uh, the graph up to 1995, I counted some uh, nine failures in 11 years. And if we look at the seven years after that, uh, I counted uh, only three failures. Uh, three ruptures, I should say, sorry. Now, to put it into perspective again, uh, although, the, um, although stress goes and cracking certainly has contributed to the rupture uh, uh, threat or damage, uh, we still find that the, the, the ruptures, the, uh, the failures are driven by the other uh, causes such as metal loss and uh, improper operations, etc. And I, this slide, the point of this slide is just to show that uh, in, in balance to what I showed you before, we cannot neglect uh, the other uh, threats. I thought this slide might be a little interesting. I, I guess a lot of people who've worked in SCC have seen something like it before. Uh, what it is is the location of SCC damage with respect to distance from down, downstream from compressor stations. So we're talking about uh, gas pipelines. Uh, if you take the valve section as being approximately 30 kilometers, uh, it's clear that the first valve section has the most severe damage. Uh, the second valve section, there seems to be some drop off. But what is uh, significant, I think, is that we're starting to see uh, the threat or uh, susceptibility to the threat and evidence of the threat in valve sections further down, valve sections three and four, for example. So the NEB initiatives, I, I already mentioned back in 1995 there was the inquiry, and then 96 was the uh, the report, and it was based on uh, a very poor record up to that point. 
the report uh, provided some 27 recommendations, mainly around uh, the management of stress corrosion cracking, uh, design considerations, um, database, and, uh, and the use of data in the sharing of data in, uh, throughout the industry. The required companies to develop and implement a stress corrosion cracking program and as I pointed out in the graph that I showed you, uh, there has certainly been a significant reduction in failures after that work that was carried out. It was sponsored, of course, by the National Energy Board, but industry, in fact, uh, contributed, and it was an industry report. Uh, further to that report, we required, people, we required companies to uh, report what was then called significant uh, SCC. We continue with this word significant, although SIPA has pointed out that, uh, strictly speaking, there are better ways to describe it. So you could think of it as significant or reportable. So what is reportable is SCC that's deeper than 10% of the wall thickness and is as long or longer than the critical crack length of a 50% uh, through wall crack operating at a level of 110% percent of the pipe's specified minimum yield strength. Uh, companies report this to us and we assess uh, what the, the effect is and we keep a database of it too, of course. Now, uh, that is uh, sort of the, the story to date. Starting um, back last year, 2013, we took a different uh, or an additional uh, step uh, because we currently keep those uh, incident reports. Uh, these are lagging measures, which are very valuable. But in 2013, we decided to introduce some uh, more leading indicators that could be used by companies uh, to assess the effectiveness of their integrity management programs. And these uh, new indicators were leading, but there were a mix of leading and uh, lagging in indicators and uh, currently uh, the submission of these is restricted to the bigger companies and as we gain more in as we gain more insight into the effectiveness of these measures of course we'll expand the program uh, they're not some characteristics they are not compliance they're not intended to relate to compliance they're intended to help program uh, help companies with their own um, integrity management programs and to help us understand if companies are programs are in fact related to the experience that we are having with pipelines from our perspective. Um, is for, under, integrity, under integrity management performance measures of course is where you would find cracks and cracks as I mentioned a little bit earlier include both mechanically driven and environmentally assisted cracking, such as SCC, in the body and the seam weld. And uh, we have a definition north of the border in our standard uh, Z662. Um, with respect to the specific, uh, the specific performance measure with, for cracks, uh, this is a, a summary of what it is right here. It's the total number, of, so in, in general for all the hazards, it's the total number of features identified by inline inspection for field uh, investigation uh, according to integrity management program DIG criteria developed by the company versus the total number of field verified features found to be defects and repaired by permanent or temporary methods or mitigated by pressure reductions. So for cracks, if you look down at B there, uh, that is for cracks with a depth greater than 40% of the nominal wall thickness of the pipe. The objective is um, to make use of the comparison between the inline inspection results and what is actually verified by the program related to those and related to the whole DIG program. The path forward for the NEB, or in NEB's perspective, I should say, is that the NEB requires, company, it requires companies to use uh, well-designed 
and implemented management systems to anticipate, prevent, manage, and mitigate dangerous conditions and issues that can affect safety, security, and the environment. On a go-forward basis, the NEB's expectation is uh, that this mandatory reporting of SCC and the use of uh, and reporting of performance measures will encourage and insist operating companies to achieve this, the goal uh, for cracking and other threats. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ian. Uh, we have a microphone here in the center aisle. Uh, we welcome your questions uh, now. Uh, we have one webcast question, which I will forward to Steve. And the question from the webcast is, what is the re recommended pressure test for an adequate spike test? The, uh, the question, as Ken said, is uh, what is the recommended pressure level for an adequate spike test? As everyone probably knows in the, uh, in the DOT regulations, whether it's uh, Part 192 or Part 195, there is not a definition presently for spike test. But, but first of all, the, the spike test has to be at a, uh, at a time period. Uh, to ensure that that you have adequate time for the crack to grow and break, I know in in literature you'll see anywhere from from five minutes to to an hour in everything, and uh, and FEMSA from our standpoint are looking at it, and as as we come out with the uh, uh, with the IVP rule, we'll probably have a definition uh, on it there. As far as a uh, recommended pressure level. I think when you're looking at stress corrosion cracking, uh, or if you're looking at selective seam, all of them need to be above 100% SMICE. And I think if you go and look at uh, some of the literature, whether it's uh, literature that we've recently done on the uh, long seam ERW, which uh, shows that uh, uh, in most cases to get everything, you need to be up around 110% of SMICE. So depending upon the threat that you're looking at, uh, I would recommend it to be between 100 and 110 percent spice. Uh, if it's below that, I think you're uh, you may be wasting your time uh, uh, in it. Or if you're doing something less, you'd better really look at your reevaluation period of when the next time you need to pressure test your pipeline. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Are there any further questions for Steve and Ian? Uh, please step up to the microphone here in the center. And Jim has a microphone there. Please single Jim if you're on the side. Thank you. Can I ask a question to Robert Hall? Is that okay? Yes. Thanks, Robert. Just a quick question about the NEB or NTSB's um, work and the patterns that you drew. I thought that was quite useful looking back. <clears throat> and I know that the NTSB also uh, works with other transportation industries. Is there a role that the NTSB can play to um, bring together in particular aviation and connect it to the pipeline industry to draw joint learnings on how the two safety cultures work together and bring some of these um, learnings into, into a single forum? You know, certainly the NTSB has the charter to look at all modes of transportation. And even within my office, uh, we look at pipeline and railroad as well as transportation of hazardous material by all modes uh, is under my charter. And our board members are all, you know, highly technical in their field and look at that. And it, it is one thing that we are always looking for synergies. Uh, it's a cheap lesson if somebody else in another mode has already learned how to deal with something and we can transfer that. And I think a good example is uh, most recently the uh, SMS standard that's being developed by API as a result of one of our recommendations. Uh, for the pipeline industry. Uh, SMS has long been used in the aviation industry, and we saw that as a very valuable tool 
that the pipeline industry could use, and we gave that uh, challenge to API to develop that standard, which uh, hopefully will soon be released. Uh, so in, in that regard, yes, we do look at that. Uh, specifically with respect to forums, uh, we uh, recently this past year held a forum on lithium batteries, uh, primarily after an aviation accident. Uh, at the time, we couldn't find any pipeline uh, applications, although we did reach out to try and include them in the forum. But since we've, we've learned that uh, lithium batteries are now finding their way into ILI inspection tools. So uh, from that regard, you know, there are learnings that can be shared across the modes. Um, I noticed that in Mr. Nanny's presentation, there were seven alert notices, three of them for cast iron pipe, as well as Mr. Hall's presentation on dents with corrosion creating cracks. And both of those are distribution type materials that occur in third party damages, as well as failures in the pipeline. And I'm wondering why FIMS isn't taking a harder look at some of that material. I guess I'll be, is this speaker on? Yes. Uh, well, well, first of all, as far as, uh, as cracking and in the uh, notices, if you'll go back and, and look, uh, first of all, the advisory notices advise the operators to take a proactive approach. If you go look at at 192.613, uh, what it uh, tells an operator to do, uh, whether it's uh, additional surveillance, replacement, repair of the pipeline, uh, it does give direction that uh, basically tells you if you can't uh, monitor it and make it safe, you need to replace it. Uh, as far as regulations, uh, uh, FEMSA does not have any ongoing regulations uh, that we're looking at putting out in the near future on cast iron pipe. Uh, we do have the advisory bulletins though. Ms. Allen, maybe I just want to clarify a point on that is uh, there are a number of ways. I mean, cast iron is hugely important. Um, and, uh, you know, back in 2009, we did uh, issue the regulation on distribution integrity management, and that's a key method to deal with that asset there. And by 2011, operators had to have plans in place to deal with it. But cast iron is a huge uh, component of the aging infrastructure that uh, you know, needs to, we need to take a close look at. Um, and then also, we've, you know, just you know, within our call to action, the Secretary's call to action, uh, that was a big push. Also now, uh, we've kind of been using our bully pulpit, if you will, to promote the um, you know, re replacement of aging infrastructure, which would include uh, cast iron or other high maintenance type uh, pipe in, in particular. But DEMP, uh, our bully pulpit, and then also we've recently adopted or uh, put on our website uh, information on cast iron inventory by state to kind of show the track record of uh, the reduction in that inventory. But it's all related to cast iron, but yeah, it is. Important. Also, I'd like to ask if you would, uh, if you have a question, if you'd state your name and your affiliation, that'd be great. Same with our webcast uh, speakers as well, or questioners. Thanks. And then Rick, you had a question. You have a mic you can bring up. There. I know he doesn't need one, but for the webcast. <laughs> Rick Cooperwitz with Accufax. I usually represent the public, but have represented other parties in cases. Uh, without, in respect to FEMSA here, uh, in terms of the spike test parameters, you specifically indicated the risk threats associated with SCC and selective seam corrosion. Uh, again, not looking at a particular investigation you guys are focusing on right now. Do you have any other additional uh, pressure range guidance for spike testing for, say, ERW seam? Can you say that now or no? 
I think all we can say is it will be between 100% and 100% and 10% SMICE. Uh, it's part of our IVP rulemaking. Uh, Dave Warman with uh, Enterprise Products. Um, Steve, I just wanted to point out, I'm a good advocate for testing above 100%, but there are vintage pipelines out there, uh, which you're aware of, that, you know, previous mill tests were at less than 90%, and if you were to test them to 100%, you will have hundreds of failures. And that is not manageable. Um, so I think we've, we've got to be cautious on um, regulations that could pose high restrictions. Because some of these pipelines have managed their seams very well without doing a, a spike test to above 100%. And I'm in full agreement. If you can get it above 100%, do it. But we just have to be cognizant. There, so many vintage pipelines where it's just not feasible to do so. I don't know if that's a question or just a statement, but I will say that uh, I'll, I'll get a little bit into IVP, but I won't step fully in it because that's not this forum and I can't do that. But whatever we do in any rulemaking for, uh, for testing, and I, and I apologize for what I said to you earlier, but we, we, do, we will take into account uh, the 100% to 110% SMICE, but also we will take into account other options as far as uh, things that you can do pressure testing wise. So we will have both addressed. Hi, uh, it's Walter Kusick with Denbridge. A um, uh, slightly related question to uh, the question I had for Robert Hall and for you, um, Steve, or for Alan. I, I noticed that FIMSA had a long list of uh, technical requirements in, uh, in the discussion. Other industries like aviation, nuclear, and uh, other critical industries <clears throat> use a fitness for service approach. They develop safety cases that integrate all the various techniques out there for maintaining their infrastructure. Does FIMSA see a pathway to fitness for service and safety case rather than a list of specific requirements in the way that you fashion them? Uh, I'll take the uh, first cut at your uh, question. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, uh, in, in some cases, uh, we are looking at some regulations where we would consider a fitness for service type approach. Uh, until we come out with that, I just, I can't get into the details of it. But uh, the answer is, is we won't, we will not be looking that I'm aware of at a, at a fitness for service or for purpose all across the pipeline. We will be looking at it for specific situations and we are doing that now, so looking at it. Walter and, and others, when we, um, we first started talking about what we call the integrity verification process in industry, we kind of started out with fitness for service, and that was kind of internally we had some discussions. We came up with IVP, integrity verification process, so I'd say that's one area, one way to, to address that, that uh, we were looking as a potential go forward way on what you're talking about. The other aspect is, you know, the uh, Related to what's been developed or being developed by API, the RP on 1173 safety management system, we see that also as a key piece going forward as a way to uh, address uh, fitness for service or purpose, if you will. Um, you know, obviously, as we've discussed recently at the workshop that we had on that, we're going to see how that evolves and how that is uh, embraced and how effective it is to, before we, you know, decide further on a policy uh, perspective on how to pull that into our regulations or, or not. Right now we're just saying, well, let's see how it's embraced, wait and see approach on, on that. So hope that helps.
Hi, Chris Hughes, EN Engineering. I uh, hate to take us back to the spike test, but I've been going by the um, FEMSA fact sheet on hydro testing that mentions, that mirrors the old Kiefner study of the 139% of MEOP, MOP for approximately a half an hour. Uh, is that still considered a valid spike test or? I guess uh, my answer from the FEMSA standpoint would be uh, uh, if, uh, if you're the uh, engineer or the engineering company that's looking at this specific situation, uh, uh, I think you'd have to answer that. Is, are you doing a valid test based upon the specifics that you're looking, looking at? Uh, you know, is it, is it in the body? Is it in the seam? Uh, what's the toughness? Uh, when are you planning to... Uh, uh, reassess it or retest it later. Uh, I think uh, to give you a specific answer is uh, uh, without knowing more of the detail would not be appropriate today. But let me say in, in our IVP rule, we will be coming out with some specifics on, uh, uh, on spike testing there. And, uh, and other until it comes out, I, I can't get any, any more into it. Sir Gilimon with uh, Jerry Rao and Associates. No, it's just, uh, just me. Uh, this is just, uh, uh, Ian, a question for you. Uh, uh, Alan and Steve uh, mentioned the, uh, the question that uh, Walter and some others posed in terms of uh, addressing cracking and seam integrity. Would you give us uh, NEB perspective in terms of hydro study testing and also the use of FF uh, fins for service for addressing that threat? Thank you. Yeah, I'll do what I can, uh, Sergio. Um, I mentioned 27 uh, recommendations that came out of the 96 uh, report, and one of them was uh, to make explicit use of hydro tests where it was where it's appropriate. I mean, the NEB recognizes the limitation or the challenges associated with hydro tests, but it certainly ought to be one that is considered. In, uh, in dealing with, with any cr with cracking threat because uh, the, the state of the art otherwise uh, still has limitations, still can have limitations in certain cases. With respect to fitness for service, um, yeah, we, we, we do entertain that in specific, again, I, I noticed Steve's answer, uh, he, uh, he, he mentioned, or I beg your pardon, Alan, I think it was, um, a case-by-case -case basis, but we have on a case-by-case -case basis looked at uh, engineering assessments, uh, the, the Canadian term, um, which essentially comprise fitness for service under certain conditions, and uh, then, of course, follow up and make sure that the conditions under which the fitness for service were, were uh, proposed are implemented, and we may even, in those cases, implement more uh, conditions ourselves. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a question of gauging, I'll just pick up Walter's word, the safety culture. It's a, a question of gauging whether the, the, the execution of the fitness for service is, uh, is uh, representative or il illustrative of a good safety culture. Uh, if, if I had a magic wand and just one shot in it, I would forget everything and just point it at safety culture because it is the way that c operators regard risk, regard consequences, and the methodologies that they use in, uh, in um, applying these, uh, rec these requests to the board, like fitness for service, that I think um, underscores for us the worth of the fitness for service, Sergio. Hey, uh, Ken, Alan. This is uh, Bob Smith with uh, DOT FEMS's R&D program, and I want to make the comment about our focus in R&D on cast iron, which is more of a recent focus in the last year. 
We've awarded three core projects dealing with cast iron issues. One of them is dealing with uh, the idea of detecting graphitic corrosion from the surface. And we have two strong projects looking at uh, the integrity of cured in place liners. And we have those two projects working together. So we're beginning that focus. We're going to pull that focus into the next couple days at the R&D form. And I envision it to still be a significant focus of the research program. Thanks, Bob. Uh, just to follow up, I guess, Sergio, you'd asked me as well on um, the last question, just related to um, hydrostatic testing in general. I think, and as Steve had pointed out in his presentation, we're really looking for, for um, operators just to make sure they use all the tools in their toolbox, you know, in addition to the inline inspection, the direct assessment, the indirect assessment, um, just appropriately use uh, and, and understand the limitations of each. Obviously, there are current issues with hydrostatic testing where, you know, it tells you what it, that it's good, it'll handle the pressure now, but it really doesn't tell you much about what's still in the pipeline. Inline inspection really tells you a good bit about what's in the pipeline, but we're just saying, you know, if you look at these lessons learned, it's just, hey, we're missing some stuff. We need to, need to do a better job of matching the technology and the unknowns uh, with, with uh, the pipeline. So that's really what that's about. And, you know, fitness for service, like I said, we, you know, that's really rolled up into what we call the integrity verification process that we have had quite a bit of uh, dialogue with industry and other stakeholders on. And, um, and by the way, I, I didn't I failed to mention, we are also looking at addressing that, uh, and we'll be talking further about that with the liquid industry as well as far as uh, integrity verification, which is the fitness for service, if you will, for liquid pipelines as well. So stay tuned on that. Are there any more questions? Okay, uh, thank you everyone. Uh, we're gonna move on to panel two. The next portion of the uh, of the uh, crack detection workshop will be the uh, the pipeline operators' perspectives. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Dave uh, Eisbert with Explorer Pipeline. Uh, he will uh, be first to go through uh, from an operator perspective uh, on the uh, hazardous liquid pipeline perspective side. Dave, thank you. Well, I have the privilege today to present what is industry's response to cracks, but more specifically, what is industry doing to prevent and manage the cracks in, in pipelines? You know, uh, API, the American Petroleum Institute, and the Association of Oil Pipelines are two representative groups for the pipeline industry. And the two groups have been especially supportive in areas of improving safety and the integrity of pipeline systems. You can see in the organization structure, there's a lot of sub-teams in these two groups. They work very well together. An initiative that I'll be talking about today falls under the Pipeline Integrity Work Group. It's over on the lower right-hand side. You know, uh, industry has made some good progress in reducing the traditional causes of pipeline incidences, things like corrosion, third-party damage. 
But you know, we've seen a rise in incidences that are more subtle, interactive, and hard to detect. And after seeing an increase in crack failures, we started doing some investigative work around what was the cause of some of these failures. Well, our survey showed that operators are kind of applying a lot of different assessment techniques and technologies. And there was no consistency amongst the industry about what they were doing, and the results were very mixed. So it really b highlighted the need to come out with a recommended practice in the area of crack and crack response. You know, there, there uh, also was a lot of recent large incidences. We heard some of them being discussed this morning. Uh, the Marshall, Michigan, the Mayflower. And this kind of further emphasized not only the need, but the, the, we really had to respond quickly to address this issue. So each year, API AOPL comes out with a strategic plan, and it takes input from all of the companies. We look at a lot of statistics, and we decide what are the important things to work on. And in the strategic plan for 14, one of the highest uh, initiatives that was, uh, came out of this was the need to develop an API recommended practice on crack detection, the analysis, and the response. Um, also, like to point out there's an initiative just listed above this, and it's talking about improving the capabilities of inline inspection tools. And Mark Piazza will be presenting some more information on this later on this afternoon. <clears throat> So the goal of this initiative was to have an approved recommendation by the end of 2014. And kind of have to uh, uh, think about the process for issuing a recommended practice. Writing it is just about half the process. The other part of it is going out and, and, and enlisting comments from everybody in the industry and then going through an, a voting and approval process on this. So all of this we hope to accomplish by the end of the year. You know, when you look at it, you know, the things that we're looking at, um, identifying cracks, it takes an awful lot of input from multiple operational, technological, and analytical sources and experts. So how do you go about doing this? Well, we went ahead and formed a team. We included all of the uh, industry experts in both the hazardous liquid and gas industry. We engaged technical consultants such as Kiefner and Associates to make sure that our results were consistent with current technology. And we also incorporated work from SEPA, all the R&D work that has been going on by the industry and the regulators. And we also looked at any existing standards and documents and research that had been done, incorporated all this work together. So what we found out is that communications is really critical in this. Uh, in order to facilitate, you know, an API process ap uh, approval, you know, we're making sure that we're communicating to all of the stakeholders ahead of time so everybody's kept appraised of what's going on, hopefully to reduce the amount of comments that we have. If people are able to comment during the writing phase, hopefully all these issues will be addressed ahead of time. But that's also part of my purpose today is communicating to you what the industry is working on. So to the public and to the regulators, what are we doing? <clears throat> what we found out is that members have been very open and transparent about their, their experiences, both good experiences and bad experiences. And really what we have today, we, we think is a good collection of industry best practices. We heard a comment earlier about how do we get all of the experiences and best practices from industry, and this is how we're doing it. Um, I'm also happy to report that of, we have 100% involvement by every member company of API, and I think that says a lot just in the interest of the companies and wanting to get together and solve this issue. So we also went and broke it down into manageable sections you find that the scope of this project is really quite wide. So how do we go about addressing and, and writing such a uh, process, uh, re recommended practice? Well, it's broken down into five teams. There's a team looking at threats, another team looking at crack remediation and response, another one looking at assessment and response, another one looking at repair methods, and then we found a need to address having critical uh, definition or consistent definitions around terms. 
So let's look at some of the philosophy or the guiding principles of this recommended practice. First, we wanted the scope to be a pipeline crack management for both hazardous liquid and gas steel pipelines. <clears throat> it has to be flexible. You know, all pipeline systems are unique. There's no one solution that we can say, if we run this tool, if we do this pressure test, that it's gonna be the end all solution to any kind of crack. It's not. And all uh, uh, pipeline systems are designed differently. So it has to be flexible. It's gonna require an in-depth knowledge of your pipeline system. So that includes not just the material classification, so what's the manufacturer, the data that it was manufactured, the process, what kind of coating, but also the environmental conditions. What's the pH of the soil? Are there soil stresses in there? Um, it's, you also have to have a history of the uh, system. So what were the prior failures on that system, if there were any, history of corrosion, and then finally, any kind of operating data is critical. So what are the pressure cycles it's seeing? What is the temperatures it's seeing? So this RP is not designed to replace an integrity management process. We have an integrity management plan. It is meant as more as enhancing your integrity management plan. <clears throat> and we also wanted this to address all types of crack failures. We heard some talk about, you know, stress corrosion cracking, but there's also a lot of other types of cracks out there. And it's also important to note, too, that when you have all this data, and, and it's important to have all this data, it's going to take the integration of this data and all of the threats to find out where is the susceptibility for these unique types of cracks and where do I have to look in my pipeline system to look for those. And it's going to require data integration. So when we talk about the scope, <clears throat> so it's on environmental cracking, it's not just stress corrosion cracking, but it's stress corrosion cracking in high pH, neutral soils, axial, circumferential. It's also sulfite stress cracking, hydrogen-induced cracking, stress-oriented hydrogen-induced cracking. It also is going to address manufacturing defects. So especially around the seams, so ERW seams, flash welded, submerged arc welded, and double submerged arc welded. It's also cracks due to mechanical damage. We heard comments about uh, combining, uh, looking at data from dents, corrosion, and the cracks that are formed from that. Construction defects, fatigue cracking, and then cracks in repairs, buckles, and hot sp hard spots. <clears throat> So we're all familiar with the process improvement cycle, plan, do, check, and act. So in order to eliminate crack failures, we're going to have to put into place a management system that addresses all of these. And this recommended practice has guidance in every facet around this process improvement. So let's dive down a little bit deeper and talk about the planning stage. You know, this is where you go ahead and you gather all the relevant data particular to the threats that you're trying to identify. And this includes attributes of the pipe, operating history, past inspections, leak history, corrosion uh, data, and also repair history. And then, like I said before, integrating all of those to find out where are the, are the uh, susceptibility on your pipe. So after this, <clears throat> going to have to identify what tools are you going to use to go ahead and assess a look at for assessment of these cracks. So inside the RP there's a lot of discussion about the various tools. And it's not just ILI tools, there's also a good discussion around hydro testing and spike testing. Around uh, ILI tools, the tools that are discussed and it talks about their abilities to detect certain types of cracks and defects and it talks about ultrasonic tools liquid coupled angle beams, phased array, EMATS, flex, uh, magnetic flux leakage, and uh, several others. So there's a lot of guidance in here about what tools you can use to do certain assessments. In the do phase, well, it's a lot more than just doing your plan that you developed in the earlier step. So that's part of it, but once you go ahead and do this, 
you're going to get an awful lot of data back, and it's important to validate that data and analyze those results. So we've all seen you run an ILI inspection on uh, looking for cracks, and you get coming back an awful lot of data coming back. Well, it's really important to go ahead and analyze that and validate it. And there's different ways of validating, both in the ditch methods and also by destructive testing. So in the ditch methods, there's an awful lot of information in the recommended practice around you know, uh, mag particles, ultrasonic, and various other methods that you can use in the ditch. You know, it's also important, and this was brought out earlier, about making sure you go back to past inspections and doing comparisons and making sure that was there any change that you noticed in cracks that were noticed from a prior run, looking for any kind of time change. Lastly, once you go ahead and identify the cracks, <clears throat> you want to go ahead and do the repairs, but you have to go ahead and there has to be some way of prioritizing what repairs you're going to do. And that involves first classifying the cracks that you're found, and we recommend three different classifications. There's likely cracks, possible cracks, and unlikely cracks. And each one of those have different responses associated with them. So. The, for likely cracks, it's an immediate response. Possible cracks, 365. And unlikely crack, cracks is to monitor. So on the repairs, <clears throat> there's an awful lot of discussion, too, in guidance on the different repair methods. So some of the methods that are talked about is replacement of the pipe, grinding out, recoding and backfilling, the different type of pipe sleeves that can be used, clamps, composite uh, reinforcement sleeves. There's also resin-filled sleeves and well deposit method. So the next step is you want to go ahead and check. So this involves an analysis of your plan. So, you know, did your plan work? Did, you know, what, uh, what in, uh, integrity management activities did you perform? And what results or improvements did you get as a result of that? And this also, we, we really look, look at leading and lagging indicators. So from, if uh, you're trying to evaluate an internal inspection program, you know, some of the leading and lagging indicators are how many successful runs were made and how many were unsuccessful. What types of cracks were found in the ILL, ILI technology that you chose? How many miles of pipe did you inspect? How many, what was the number of cracks that were called out and the number of cracks that you investigated? <laughs> Evaluating the vendor's stated accuracy with the unity plot on the depth of the cracks that were found. How many cracks were found that were not reported and how many cracks were called but were not found? And all this leads to calculating what's the probability of detection and what's the probability of classification of your cracks. For hydro testing, well, you know, what kind of margin did you use in your test pressure compared to your operating test pressure? What were the test failures? What was the cause of the test failure? Were they cracks? Was it from a, some other cause? What was the pressure level of the, of the failures? What were the size of the defects that could have passed your hydro test? Finally, the last step. You know, so far the, the RP, we're up to about 120 pages in this. It gets into, like I mentioned, awful lot of detail on some of the technical aspects in the first, especially the first two steps. But probably one of the most important steps is this last one. And that is, how do you go about incorporating all the lessons learned oops, into your plan? So there has to be a robust audit process in place. So did you get the desired uh, results that you wanted? The activities that were performed, you know, are they all documented? Is someone assigned responsibility for each one of the areas? Do they have the appropriate resources? Are the people who do the work trained and certified in their respective area? Are the action items followed up? Are you documenting all of the action items that came about? Do you have a formal review? Do you review both not only the criteria that you used, but the criteria for uh, um, assessing, for remediating, for setting your reassessment intervals? Are all those appropriate? So 
The main purpose of this step is to make sure that all these learnings are incorporated back into the process. And it takes regular and conscious steps to make sure that you do this after each assessment. And it also involves communications with your senior management so that they're aware of what's going on. <clears throat> the other thing is that once these uh, learnings are incorporated back into the plan, it's really important to go ahead and reanalyze not just the section that you were looking about, uh, at, but all the other sections on the same system and not waiting until the next reassessment interval. It may be something that you have to look at immediately. So thank you. I really wanted to just kind of give people a high level of what this RP is looking at, the detail that it is, and the, the, the scope of this recommended practice. Um, right now, we're on version about 2.1. It's uh, uh, probably in the next version that comes out, which is pretty shortly, we'll be going out for comments. We think the comments period will be in October. And we're still on track to go ahead and have this published by the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, Dave, thank you for your overview of uh, what API and the industry is doing as far as a uh, recommended practice. Uh, with that, uh, the, the next presenter uh, for the uh, gas transmission uh, side, uh, operator perspective, will be Jim Marr, manager with TransCanada. Jim? Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> um, as part of uh, being asked to give a talk today on behalf of Inga and the natural gas uh, folks, the natural gas operators, one of the things we really talked about was how to bring um, maybe some educational baselines into the system and some of the developments that we've been working on within the natural gas uh, world per se. Now, within INGA itself, we're all striving for the middle circle and two things that are going to come through on the presentation today. One is, uh, well, they're primarily built from the SCC JIP2 uh, which happened between 2010 to 2012, and that document now is with ASME and hopefully to be published soon. Now, within INGA, of course, um, the, one of the bigger things is, is developing technologies to help us find crack-like crack defects, getting that information across to all the different operators or all the stakeholders that are, are part of the INGA system. I think in the INGA Trust, there's over 120 groups that represent operators, vendors, ILI people, NDE people, that sort of thing. And part of the issue here is to make sure that we're all speaking the same language when we get talking. And that's to the next point about nomenclature. And a lot of what's gone on this morning is talking about defects that are injurious to a pipeline, uh, whether it's gas or liquids. The other thing for me today is to make sure that I keep it from the fence going outwards, okay? So this is mainly line pipe steels, that sort of thing. Detection, identification, and characterization. Historically, I think uh, this is my 29th year, and I spend a lot of time in the field, and we still come up with uh, things like surface breaking laminations being called SEC. So we have to continue that training uh, with, our, with our partners who are in the ditch doing and collecting a lot of this data, as Steve mentioned. Now, when we come into management of crack-like crack defects, of course, you've got hydrostatic testing, direct assessment, and inline inspection. And for natural gas, a lot of work has happened with the EMAT inline inspection tool, and we're quite pleased where this is going. Obviously, prevention, uh, how do we not get them? Fatigue has come back up again in our world in the natural gas. It's not something that I've seen a lot of in natural gas systems, but it's something that we condition monitor. And then finally, we'll just wrap it up. So something that's changed, of course, is in the nomenclature, you have external corrosion, environmentally assisted cracking, and resident features. Now, resident features is a, is a new term for me. This is uh, replacing stable the word stable, um, if you're familiar with that. And uh, what we're going to do is go through a series of pictures and slides. And for some of you that have spent a lot of time with this, this might be 
kind of elementary, but at the same time, if you're in the ditch doing this work and you can't distinguish or delineate or discriminate, whatever word you want to use, it becomes very, very important. Now, SEC itself is a form of an EAC. It's in there with corrosion fatigue and hydrogen uh, cracking, of course. And often we want to be able to understand what are the relationships to SEC. Now, uh, Ian pointed out uh, back in the 95, 1995, uh, the inquiry up in Canada, that brought a lot of things to light as to how we go out and find it, what we do with it, how we address the severity. And that also came through with the JIP. Okay, the JIP, the second one, was eight gas operators who got together and built on uh, an additional five years of experience from the initial JIP, which was done in 2006, 2007, roughly in that area. And one of the big things for us, of course, was to have some commonalities in how we do and collect data in the field, and we'll get a little more into that. So one of the things I'm often dealing with is the differences between high pH and low pH SCC. And for you guys that know me, some of this, I'm a picture guy. Um, you can see that this is intergranular, and the slide on your right is a picture of high pH SCC, often characterized by being quite linear and a wide circumferential spacing between the individual cracks. So far, pretty good, pretty easy. This is also high pH SCC, and the reason that we did this in, in sharing this today is so that we can have these experiences where not everything is as easy as this one compared to this one, okay? And this is part of what we're doing by sharing is to get this information out on the high pH SEC. Now, high pH in its own right is never associated with external corrosion and has a pipe surface, which often is called the electrolyte, of between um, 9 and 11, if you can get a pH. Well, often with high pH, the coatings are cooked in the sense of being uh, absent from the pipeline, or if they are, they're despondent. The key for SCC is to have a disbonded coating, okay? It's really critical. So if you're in the ditch doing this work, you know, it's, it's good to be nice to your, to your direct examination contractor who do the NDE work so that they can understand that with coating identification, coating types, coal tars and asphalts are different from tapes and waxes, that they, they really work hard at where coatings are adhered and where they're disbonded. And as Ian pointed out also, too, a lot, of for a lot of SCC of a more serious nature is still being found in that first valve section. Low pH SCC, and there's a cross section, a thin section, and then a typical colony, tips and tails. And you can start to see that the density of individual cracks within the colony is more concentrated. And you can actually see where the tips and the tails are coming together. The association with, with external corrosion is also important uh, with low pH SCC. It's commonly within it. As the next one down below, there's a crack right running through these series of pits that are becoming interlinked, which is another term, uh, or adjacent to the, uh, the, the external corrosion. So something else that's come up and it's been mentioned earlier also is how to deal with hydrogen. And more often than not, uh, we've had to re reanalyze information coming from the field. When you compare these types of defects to this one, things are different. This is a small gouge in a, in a pipeline, of course, and the cracking or the more, and the appearance of the cracking under the mag particle is terribly different. So how do we document that and how are we sure about what we're doing? So with resonance um, anomalies, these are commonly a lack of fusion hook cracks, that sort of thing. And they're ter they are different from an EAC in the sense that we need an environmental component for stress corrosion cracking to initiate and propagate. Well, a lot of the resident anomalies that we're seeing are, are right from the manufacturing process itself, and um, not all of them are bad. And as I mentioned a, a minute ago, lack of fusion and hook cracks are the two major ones. But as we get into the EMAT development for crack detection, there's a lot of other things that we see in both EFW, ERW, even DSAW type longitudinal seams, and they're listed down below with the contact marks, the trimming, 
uh, scalp edges because the physics of these tools that we're running, they see lots of different patterns. And it, it can happen in the same way when you're doing the direct examination. You've excavated the pipe, you've cleaned the pipe, you've done the mag particle, they put uh, ultrasonic uh, tools onto the pipe to do depth measurements, whether it's handheld traditional UT or phased array, often they will run into troubles with some of these other defects that are mentioned down below here. Here's an EFW long seam in cross section. Okay, this is primarily one manufacturer. It's the same manufacturer whether it's 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, vintage steels. And in the diagram or the picture on the right hand side, you can see a lack of fusion coming down into, into the, the seam itself. This is how it looks in plan view when you do the MPI. Again, it's, a, it's classified as a lack of fusion. We've got a nice ruler. And uh, for us, a lot of our work is done by RTD because we spent the time developing that partnership. But what's also critical here is that one manufacturer in this case has this specific seam. So when we're out there, we know that we're dealing with this manufacturer. We then know what types of resident anomalies we should be seeing. Okay? We also can have STC, but it's often in the body and not in the seams. Another example, and this is fairly recent, where we've got a hook crack on the ID of, a, of an EFW long seam. And again, when you do the mag particle, we're not going to see this. So this is an EMAT correlation dig, and the EMAT tool found this. Okay? And it finds lots of good things. It does its job in the sense of finding linear type indications, and we move forward from there with our programs. When we get to ERW welds, you'll notice right away that there's, there's not the, uh, the edge effects on both either the ID or OD, but you do run into trouble uh, in the sense that sometimes the, uh, the scalping marks along the longitudinal seam are enough for initiation points of SCC, but we've also seen different manufacturers only a year apart with two different SCC personalities. One has a lot and one has none, basically. So that's kind of interesting. So this is, again, OD to ID, and this is lack of fusion. And here's how this appears, again, in an ERW weld, very similar to an EFW weld. This picture is from uh, John Beavers at DNVGL, showing a lack of fusion with a hook crack combination. I think this has been out in the public quite a bit, but it's two, two different uh, resident anomalies located in an ERW weld. Well, again, development of our EMAT tools, this is the kind of thing that we can see. And again, when we do the MPI, we're looking at um, the hook cracks in plan view. You can start to discriminate hook cracks from lack of fusion and then from SCC. I think the patterns are very recognizable and we can move forward there with our NDE technicians. This is again ERW pipe with a minor SCC colony in the long seam with adjoining um, hook cracks on either side of the weld material. Again, uh, this is from the early, early 90s. And so from a technology point of view, we didn't have the tools back in that period to do a lot of sizing. With, uh, primarily, we would have to use a grinder uh, to do this type of work. So when we look at other things with uh, resident anomalies that can confuse us in the sense of, are these STC? Well, some folks think this was. But here we have a surface breaking lamination, and this is just rolled into the steel. Well, the easiest thing to do here, of course, is to take your file, non-power tool, and just peel it across it in a perpendicular manner. That peels the metal back, and away we go. So we go from here being all alarmed about the SCC to here. And these are types of things, and the reason for showing these is to have that experience where there's a lot of things that can happen on the pipeline, but they're not all that bad. Now when it comes to external corrosion, we do see SCC obviously in, in, in corrosion. I've showed a picture of that uh, earlier. And, and pr primarily, well most of the time, it's low pH SCC. In this case, You've got a bit of channel or sodding corrosion going on, and the SCC is, is quite pronounced in this, at this uh, site. This is about 70 inches long in total. Now when it comes to detection, 
and this is something that the JIP spent a lot of time with, is where we're going um, with ASME, the ASME criteria, and that is the fundamental building block for us in natural gas systems. And so we start with the five criteria uh, for both high and low pH, and we treat them similarly. Um, the thing that happened in the JIP2 that was transferred over to a lot of the INGA members, of course, was to come up with a EMAT direct examination procedure that allows us to be consistent in how we're evaluating the EMAT tool itself. That way then when we're doing our inspections, we're doing things consistently. And importantly too is to establish where there is no cracking. Okay, as I mentioned for us, uh, to have SEC, you need to have a disbonded coating. And being able to show and prove where it's, the coating is adhered to where it's disbonded are key, key elements to the detection of SEC. Now with EMAT, of course, one of our, our, our goals or one of our objectives was to take it and say, are we, are we needing or can we replace it, EMAT inline inspections uh, and remove some of the hydro testing. And in some cases, we believe we can. Um, for years now, at least two to three years, I've been saying that EMAT will find big stuff for us and it's done that time in and time out. And we've now run over, well over 30 runs ourselves um, in the JIP back in the day, we had other operators who added their EMAT um, data to our, into our uh, programs that we did, and there's well over 4,000 miles now, and we're still collecting more and more information. What's critical is we're collecting that information, again, in a consistent manner when we do the uh, conf confirmatory excavations. The other thing that's happened that we've shared, of course, is that where we run an EMAT tool, we've also come through with a hydrostatic test. And in that case, we've never had a false negative. Yes, I have to make sure on that. Um, but we still work, are working with the ILI vendors. And one of the keys for us here, and it's, it's important for us, and I think it's important for the industry, is that we have a little different relationship on the EMAT development. It's more of a partnership. We run a tool. We work with our ILI folks. They look at their algorithms, they get people in the ditch, so they see what we see. The nomenclature gets cleared up, there's not this hide and seek thing going on, so it's quite an open system, and that's allowed us to move fairly quickly in a short period of time with the EMAT tool development. So one of the things I wanted to show when we're setting up this presentation is the EMAT investigative procedures that we've, we have. We're quite proud of this, to get eight groups together to do something uh, was kind of interesting, and now we've got it done. And this is the first step, of course. The, the red box is your anomaly. The blue box is your is your zone where you want to make sure if you've got a bit of uh, uh, your odometer has been slipping or something of that nature so that you can cover it off. You take the coatings off. You describe the deposits. Now, this sounds very similar, similar to when I'm teaching. Uh, we have to make sure we understand what's on the pipe surface. Well. Again, dealing with SCC and two types of SCC, you want to understand your pHs. If you can't get to the ditch within half a day, the pHs are usually gone. But when you're working with your NDE contractors who are doing your direct examination, you can work backwards from the corrosion deposits on the pipe surface. And these, if you can see it actually down into this area, the actual cracking is visible to the naked eye. Now, Prior to 2010, I think I can count on one hand and maybe three fingers the number of times I've seen that. So things have changed quite a bit, and this has come out with other uh, presenters this morning, is that you have to be continually monitoring and watching what things are going on on your pipeline. Things are not always consistent. We know certain areas of our system, for instance, are not as prone to SEC as others. We set up the ILI feature call, just as like I showed you in the diagram. After we clean the pipe, we come back with the, the box again. Now, this is labor intensive, and yes, it takes time. But remember, we're trying to develop a technology. We're trying to make sure we understand all the different things, the parameters related to what that tool is seeing. And we, you know, we're approaching, you know, uh, well over 3,000 kilometers, 2,000 miles type thing and with controlled excavations. And so that gives us a lot of confidence and when we clean it up, we can see this type of thing. Again, is this a low pH or a high pH type cracking? And now that we've seen a few of those, this should cause some discussion. 
Again, here's, here it is. And here's another one. Again, from the same ILI run, we're, we're in a different coating. This is asphalt. This is tape. And away we go. Uh, third valve section, second valve section, that sort of thing. All of this information is collected. We want to understand where we are, distance from a, uh, a compressor station, that sort of thing. The conditions of the coatings. We do get into the environmental aspects of the SCC. Okay, a lot of the uh, resident anomalies that we're seeing are often under or associated with a really well bonded coating, usually a coal tar or asphalt. So. There's, not, there's a bit of a lacking in a growth uh, environmental aspect to help any growth along there. When we correlate the tool to the field, we want to be very cognizant of what we're seeing, apples to apples type thing, and you've heard this before, I'm sure. But in this case, you know, this colony itself um, is fairly long, it's a healthy one, and it's approaching that 50% through wall. And part of what happened through the JIP was a lot of confidence was installed in the other operators. Not everybody has an SCC problem. Um, that's, that's clear. But how we go about to investigate if there's things you want to do. And the thing that came out from the JIP is to make sure that we're understanding and have, have a consistent manner on how we're evaluating the EMAT tool itself. Um, the other thing that we're doing is to look at how EMAT can help us with our hydrostatic testing. At least at TransCanada, we are in single to double digits hydrostatic testing. We have a fairly routine schedule. Um, when Ian showed the one slide from 1995 up, there was only a couple in 2009 and 2011. And from 92 through to the present time, we've had a very very aggressive hydrostatic testing program, primarily on our mainline asset. And what we're hoping is that the EMAT inline inspection tool itself, with the way that we've been collecting information and we've been at it now for a good solid five years, is that it can help us um, to learn more about our system. Now something that came out of the JIP, of course, and this is again just over a five-year window, was to look at within management for SCC you do have hydrostatic testing as one of your principal tools that we, in gas systems, and we use it, and we still use it. Um, we have to, as you, you heard earlier, there's a bit of debate about where to test, how to test. SCC is primarily that 100 to 110 percent SMICE, and that works fairly well. But you've got to be cognizant that some of the steels you're dealing with could have uh, resident type of, of anomalies in them, and that can be, um, create issues for you. So in the JIP itself, of course, we had 85 documented cases, and this just summarizes the failures and leaks and the burst tests that we did from an 8-inch up to a 42-inch pipelines. Uh, the incidence of finding more SCC in smaller diameter pipelines was interesting from a gas perspective. Most of our work was primarily 16-inch and above in the past. The other thing that was very important to us when Ray, Dr. Fessler and David Dott and the really, really smart people working on a lot of the cases here on the, on the flaw profiles, what was going on to understand them. And we compared and evaluated, I think, four or five different engineering assessment tools, you know, core loss, that sort of thing, to help us understand where we fit in with the severity. So with uh, the long-term management, uh, Within INGA, we're still recognizing uh, that uh, hydrostatic testing is an important uh, tool for us. We've, I think, substantiated how and when we test and the interval for testing. Uh, one other thing that's come out of the JIP itself was the use of SCCDA, and that is a very good tool for understanding your pipeline. When it comes to fatigue, one of the things that INGA is doing is revisiting the whole fatigue in natural gas pipelines, and that's subject to a new project that's about to be initiated. When it comes to new pipelines, and at least for SCC or environmental type things, we really got to pay attention. I think Steve hit some of the, the high points this. Um, when you put on the new high performance coatings, you take away any residual surface stresses, so SCC technically goes away, which is a good thing. You don't have to worry about that. And that's it. Any questions?
before we take a break, are there any questions for Dave or Jim? Brian Lease, BN Lease Consultant. Um, good presentation. I'm going to speak to Jim in particular. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the issue of ILI and hydro testing for someone else and, and, and talk about, uh, ask you to talk about resident versus stable, specifically to discriminate between stable and its introduction was to talk about what didn't or typically didn't grow versus resident now describing features that are construction features. Is that a correct assessment, or material and construction features? Uh, yeah, it is, Brian. Um, stable equals resident, and resident is the new term. Okay. Um, second question, if I might, relates to uh, the, the dis discrimination between low pH and high pH relative to the colony appearance. Yes. Um, given the environments are re reversible, Number one, and given the role of stress and its influence on relative spacing, how confident are you that that you can, by appearance, make that discrimination? Um, we're getting better, Brian, every year. Uh, to help us out, you know, we do remove a lot of pipe and we do the metallography on it, so that gives us some confidence for recognizing patterns when we're doing the MPI. Tom Bubernick at, with DNV GL. Jim, this is also directed at you. I wondered if you would comment a little bit on the role of coalescence on the final failures that we're seeing. Obviously, coalescence is important in the lifetime of a crack, but what role do you think coalescence fail posed in some of the failures that you looked at as part of the JIP? Well, that, that's a good question, Tom. Um, one of the new learnings out of the JIP was the, was the coalescence effects of uh, toe cracks on d seams and tape-coated lines and how fast they're, they're coalescing, actually. In the past, we, we've had toe crack uh, incidents and we still find them, but this was a, a, a unique failure in the sense when Dr. Fester looked at it, he was quite surprised himself. And so whether it's a colony in the body or a colony in the tented region or a toe crack in your D-cell seam, the ability to look at interlinking, and this also comes back to data collection in the field with your NDE contractors, right? And how clean is that pipe surface? Do they buff it off a bit? And do they, can they give you an accurate reading that shows you, say, you're sitting at your desk and can show you the coalescence on a pipeline that you've been monitoring for 20 plus years? It is, it's important, it's really critical now. Okay, I'm afraid we're gonna have to cut this session short. I think we've, we've had a death march here this morning before the first break, and I can see a little bit of squirming in the audience there. So what we'll do is, is uh, if you do have a question, hopefully you know we'll have some time, hopefully we'll get a little slack later, but uh, I would encourage you also to talk at the break if you have any questions. I, just for your, uh, information we have as far as attendance today so far we have 180 here who are in the room with us today and then on the webcast uh, those of you tuning in we have 220 uh, coming in on the webcast so very much appreciate your participation there I'd like to encourage you also we, could, we had to cut short the questions uh, last time but I would encourage you uh, especially on the webcast if you have questions please feel free to to click the button and uh, send it in, and we'll uh, do our best to get it up here. Uh, next, I'd like to turn it over to Joshua Johnson, who will be the moderator of our next panel. Joshua. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to join in thanking everyone for being here. Um, this is a topic that's been near and dear to my heart for quite a while. Um, I know that it, for some people it wasn't the easiest travel in with some of the weather yesterday. So those of you who came in at 2 o'clock in the morning and still have your suitcases here, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for coming in and instead of going, in, going to bed and things like that. Um, we're going to have two panels on uh, technology developments. Um, the first one, uh, we're going to start off with a, uh, a, 
talk by Brian Lees, who is an independent consultant now after working many years at Patel, uh, to talk about a summary of detection parameters. Good morning, all. Um, put the title slide up. I'm talking about inspect in inspection parameters, as Joshua has pointed out. Um, that's really a subset of detection, which can, as Steve slides indicated, uh, encompass a fairly broad cross-section of issues. So by way of outline, I'm going to talk about parameters and, and uh, a little bit that might be obvious to some why and what parameters. I'm then going to talk about failure mechanisms and the implications. Go on from there to talk about um, their role in integrity management planning and um, presumably some role in IVP, although IVP is still pending, has been pointed out this morning, and then talk briefly about uh, implications of vendor specifications, go to needs and gaps, uh, which has some implications for what goes on in the R&D forum, continuing from here, and, and then do summary and conclusions. So why inspect? Um, inspections needed to quantify condition. Um, and we have tools that are non-destructive, such as uh, ILI and in the ditch. We have also above ground DA based kinds of tools which are non-destructive. Others are destructive such as the hydro test that's been talked about at length this morning. Um, grinding which uh, can be used for SCC to, uh, to get some idea of shallow depths at least. And overlaid on these tools are the technologies that they function by uh, particularly or obviously then for the non-destructive tools. Condition is, a, is an input to decision making. Um, again, IVP and IMP play here. Um, there's a need to get severity out of this. There's a need to get a response timeline out of this. Um, there are also aspects that, that involve economics and decisions, for example, as to when and how to replace, et cetera. So the nature of the decision and the circumstances dictate what parameters are needed and, and really the extent to which uh, accuracy and precision are required. Um, cracking, many people think, involves sharp features, and that's true initially, but in very tough steels, those features blunt. So there's a need to think about cracking from the perspective of blunted cracks in tough steels, as well as the response of sharp cracks in less tough steels, obviously of the two, the sharp cracks and less tough steels pose much more of an issue. Um, we need parameters such as size, shape, orientation, and proximity to other features. Jim Moore spoke about SCC in the presence of features. How close together they are is critical as to whether or not two independently characterized features can coalesce and then very rapidly cause failure. So that's a, a particular issue of some concern. Um, we need to quantify size and shape and how to do that's obviously an issue. Uh, in the end, we, we end up sometimes, as Jim pointed out, with what are, what are viewed as boxed features. Uh, other times cracking is, is grouped uh, in, in the output of the ILI vendor by depth intervals. Um, it would be nice if we could think about length and depth in an idealized shape, but reality often doesn't take us there. And I have some images in uh, this chart which uh, help to identify that. If you look at the top feature on what would be the far, uh, that side of the room, <laughs> because left and right depends on whether you're looking out or looking in. Um, that, there is a feature there at, at the very top which is more or less constant depth, very nice uh, in terms of its length, easily characterized analytically. One beside it that's less so easily characterized. The uh, piece in the middle is, is uh, a series of hook cracks which uh, uh, perhaps are close enough together to have uh, influenced each other in this failure, one from the ID, one from the OD. Below that is uh, selective seam corrosion and, and it's really a segment along uh, a, a, a segment of, a, a series of segments of selective seam corrosion and at the bottom is SCC and you can see there a series of 
segments, each of which represent individual cracks that now have coalesced, leading to this failure. So coalescence, again, important. From the outside, if you look at features, you can get nice straight linear features. In cross-section, you can see a variety of, of up the bottom you see uh, uh, what is a, a string of coalesced axial cracking, but shallow enough not to have caused failure. So reality in this context can be quite complex. Uh, let's turn our attention now to uh, the implications of the failure mechanism. Initially, sharp features, as I pointed out, will blunt in tough, tough steels and are, are far less a concern. Net section collapse applies to those features, not fracture mechanics. Um, and net section collapse is controlled by area lost and, and ultimate stress. And you can almost think about them in the context of something like a modified B31G. And in, on the other side of it are, are features that are fracture controlled and length and depth are critical for them as well as toughness. Um, and I think most people in the room, what's on this chart's fairly obvious, so I, I won't uh, dwell on it except to say that the loading, the properties, and the anomaly size, shape, and orientation combine to determine the failure behavior and the failure pressure. So it's not just the anomaly, but the properties and the loading also play into this. And the accuracy and, and the detail to which you need support from an inspection depend on on the end use and the consequences uh, obviously being a, a key parameter in that context and quite logically certainty of other key parameters for example if you don't know the toughness there's not a lot of sense in getting too concerned about the size and the shape uh, deal with it as the bottom line so um, let's let's look at implications for failure in in terms of of failure pressure the vertical axis in both of these charts is the failure pressure normalized by the pressure at SMYS. So one, a line across these charts at one corresponds to uh, what would be the limit of elastic response. A line at 0.72 corresponds to 72% SMYS, or class one service if it's a gas line. Line at 0.4, 40%, etc. And the vertical line across the top, the solid vertical line across the top, that denotes Y over T. So uh, obviously, all the points emanate from that corner, Y over T, sorry, 1.43 more or less here, which is the ratio of the tensile strength to the yield strength. So this is uh, uh, an X52, an early X52. Um, and you can see that with all points emanating from there, if you're dealing with, let's say, a modern uh, X80, and Y over T is not 1.4 now, but it's 1.1 that, or 1.15 or even less, uh, that all of the points would be emanating from uh, uh, a number on the order of the vertical axis 1.05. Um, comparing the two charts, what you see on, on uh, what is the far side that way uh, is, is a result at 20 foot pounds, and what you see in the adjacent chart closer to the labels on the side here is a result at five foot pounds and obviously the influence of toughness is to shift, shift these curves tremendously. Uh, failures become uh, far more common and more likely at lower pressures for the lower toughness. It's fairly illogical but this begins to make clear how significant those changes are. Obviously for, for tough steels and long features a length isn't a very important parameter. It's depth controlling what goes on. Um, so it, in many ways, it's toughness, length, and Y over T that, that dictate, and then depth discriminates whether or not it fails. So one analyst's view and in, in somewhat of a summary of what we've talked about to this point, um, uncertain, uncertainty in properties, and particularly toughness, will be a first-order driver in terms of the results uh, with respect to failure pressure, in terms of results then because failure pressure affects critical defect length, uh, also timeline to fail, um, and obviously the decisions that depend on that. So the role or, or acceptance of uncertainty in sizing, and I'm talking here about sizing in the context of inspection now, uh, 
Toughness is a first order factor, as I mentioned. It discriminates the failure mechanism. It discriminates what sizes can fail. And there's really not too much need to concern yourself with detailed precision and size if you don't know toughness. Um, the, the longer, tougher features, uh, length is much less important. I pointed out Y over T can be important, particularly for shallow features. Um, you can effectively ignore shallow features in steels with high Y over T that are tough. Uh, and all of the above are obviously important in terms of making timeline assessments because they influence the critical or final defect size. Uh, I want to talk now about balancing conservatism. Lots of people talk about the fact that well, we can just do our failure pressures uh, our failure pressure analysis on a conservative basis, but the message that comes from this is if you go conservative in regard to failure pressure, you get non-conservative outcomes in regard to timeline. So ultimately, we have to come to grips with the fact that we need to be accurate in pressure predictions in order to get reasonable results. So we, we simply can't be conservative on both. They offset each other, that conservatism. So we need a balance, we need accurate tools, and ultimately accurate sizing. I, I want now to talk briefly about vendor specifications and implications, and what I have is a, an illustrative or typical example of, of some specs in regard to uh, uh, the implications of specifications that talk about fractional uh, detection limits. What we see are three different pipes, one 16 inches in diameter, one 10 inches in diameter, one 22 inches in diameter, and the labels pipe 16, 16. 16 is the first of those digits is the diameter. So it's the first column is, is a 16 inch, the second column is a 10 inch, the third is a 22 inch, and we see that that same specification comes away with Minimum depths the order of 1.59, 1.73, and 1.38. Um, those in regard to the prior chart can have a significant influence on whether or not an inspection according to such specifications is perceived to be uh, equivalent to a hydro test. So the, the idea from my perspective is if you want to talk about specifications, you should talk about specifications in the context of equivalence to a hydro test rather than fractional numbers and that takes then the vendor's specification and forces you into translating it into something that is specific to your pipeline. Um, if you think about this, it means that the merits of some tool runs depend on the pipe size and the properties and I, I've been involved with a number of scenarios where an inline inspection does you no more good than telling you the fact that that day-to-day -day pressure uh, results are as good as running the tool. The, the detection capabilities of the tool were no better from a pressure perspective than, than the pressure that's active day to day. Um, I want to talk about implications of properties. I've got here a chart that on the vertical axis that's toward that wall um, is, is the full size equivalent energy. The axis that's toward the other wall is shear area, and the bottom is temperature. So these are typical results from Sharpie tests done in the bond line, done in the area of the upset, which would relate to uh, hook cracks and, and uh, done in the body. And we can see three different lines appropriately labeled, and you can see significant differences at typical operating temperatures for those toughnesses. The bottom line is that if you do an inspection and you get an answer back that gives you an indication and you're not sure whether the indication is in the body, in the upset, or in the bond line, you have only one choice and that's to assume that it's in the bond line and be very conservative. Uh, so location, location, location becomes uh, an important parameter and, and the challenge then is, is to the vendors to supply us information that allows us to make less conservative analyses. That discrimination is obviously key, key both to severity assessments and timeline assessments. Uh, nearing the end here, I want to talk about the implications of some processes. Uh, I've got here uh, 
uh, a failure that's associated with high frequency ERW seam. Um, and Japanese produced pipe, as I recall, uh, but there's also Australian produced pipe that's had the same problems. Uh, and, and in those areas, they refer to them as paste welds. Basically, they're uh, ear, high frequency ERW seams that have bonded, but bonded poorly so that there is no interface evident in the inspection. And the, the properties of the material in that bond from a strength point of view aren't very good, but the bottom line is from lots of the other detection capabilities, it would be pretty hard to discriminate. So here we're left, left with weld seams that with a defect in them effectively that can't be, or it's unlikely to be detected with any technologies what we've got available. And there have been some, all of which were pre-service hydro test failures uh, that have exposed these. The question is, will they grow in service over time? And that's an uncertainty yet because uh, the first of these that I was exposed to was uh, in the late 90s and I've seen several since. Uh, it's a potential concern. Needs and gaps, second last chart, two minutes to go. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I would argue that we need more dialogue between those that design inspection tools and choose sensors and optimize sensors. The guys that interpret the logs and the guys that, that deal with those outcomes in terms of the direct assessment in the ditch. We need to integrate all of that and get better, log, better dialogue back and forth because the guys that ultimately uh, use the results can benefit if the results come to them in a form that's useful. The, the backwards value of that is what you learn in the ditch from a dig can influence the ILI vendors and their algorithms and their sensors to make them more effective. So there's kind of a two-way dialogue here which could be really beneficial, I think. Um, the second is that uh, ILI or in-the-ditch technology uh, to quantify toughness would be, from my perspective, very, very valuable. Uh, I know it's a big, uh, big gap to bridge, but it's, a, a, to me, a significant gap. Uh, better analysis tools uh, that will help us assess real crack, crack shapes and coalescence, I would argue as well, is a, a need or a gap that, that would have high value to be bridged. Summary and conclusions. Um, I think the current approach that's being used to manage the systems is viable. Uh, while there have been past failures of, of lines that have been inspected, they've often involved misread anomalies. So uh, we need to, to look at continued improvement in sensors and in algorithms and in broader data integration, uh, which will help us manage that. I think the broader data integration was mentioned on a couple of occasions this morning. It's a key issue here. Condition assessment relies on lots of technologies with the outcome likely improved by uh, a better collaboration between the, the players. Um, I, I think a key point here is demanding more from, more from inspection tools will not offset the implications of what you don't know about the properties, particularly the toughness. So a well-characterized feature doesn't get you anywhere unless you know the properties when you have to do the analysis. And finally, uh, failures reflect the worst case combination of feature size, shape and orientation with the loadings and the worst case properties. So while the worst case size, shape, orientation might not control failure, until we get Mensa Pig, something that's really, really smart, um, until it gets eyes and comes to life, um, the largest of the features is not a bad place to start. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Our second speaker this morning is going to be Harvey Haynes, who is the ILI qualification team lead at Keefter & Associates. Harvey. Thank you. Yeah, the microphone is Is that uh, what's playing in there? Yep. Okay. Uh, I've been asked to talk about uh, in-ditch uh, technologies for uh, sizing and assessing uh, uh, cracks in, in the ditch. And uh, so I was going to go over the existing technologies that are currently used, uh, shear wave, uh, time of flight diffraction, and phased array. Uh, these are the sort of ubiquitous ones. There's some proprietary technologies I'm not going to talk about. 
And I want to talk about the future, which is uh, acoustic imaging or ultrasonic imaging. And this is a, an emerging technology it's, uh, going by several names. Uh, inverse wave extrapolation is the uh, name that uh, my sister company, RTT, calls it. Uh, but it's also called by names like a full frame form capture, a full matrix capture, and a total focusing method. And it's being investigated at various universities around the uh, uh, US and uh, Europe. So if we look at uh, shear wave inspections, uh, what happens is you have uh, piezoelectric transducers which uh, generate a P wave, and it's uh, converted into a shear wave. And the uh, shear wave uh, travels down, and the largest uh, reflector comes from a corner reflection with a crack on the, uh, with the surface. Uh, this uh, picture here is, uh, is essentially a crack that would be on the far wall that could also be on the near wall, and you would just use the far wall as a, as a mirror uh, and get the uh, same thing from the, from the near wall. Uh, the uh, corner reflection provides a, a lot of energy back, and so it provides a lot of amplitude. And uh, the other type of uh, reflection you get back is a tip diffraction, and here the ultrasonic energy goes and uh, hits the tip, and it acts as a scattering. Uh, so some of the energy scatters back to the, uh, to the transducer, and you get a smaller type of image. So over here on the right, uh, you can see the small peaks from the tip diffraction and the large peak uh, from, the, uh, from the corner reflection. Uh, but you don't get anything from anything in between. Uh, the second uh, technique used is uh, time of flight diffraction. Uh, time of flight diffraction is uh, looking for uh, changes in the uh, time between the transmitter and the receiver. If you don't have any uh, defect in the pipe, uh, you'll get a direct uh, arrival from the transmitter to the receiver, which is represented by the red line. And you'll also get a, an arrival that uh, is represented by the green line, which is a reflection off the uh, back wall. And uh, you can see that the, the red arrival arrives first on the left, and the green arrival arrives later, and there's nothing there. Those are pretty straight lines. If you get a crack in there, then uh, the uh, uh, signal is uh, interrupted that would uh, arrive directly. And you can see over here on the left uh, that you'll have an anomaly. So the, uh, um, the anomaly, the uh, signal comes in later, and that change in time uh, can be related to the uh, uh, change in path, and uh, you can relate that change in path to the crack size. And uh, this is generally considered one of the most accurate ways of sizing uh, the, uh, the depth of a crack. But it doesn't provide any information really on the uh, geometry that exists there. And then the third technique that uh, seems to be in uh, greatest favor these days is the phased array methodology. Uh, phased array uses these uh, segmented transducers, and the, uh, the elements in those transducers can be uh, phased so they can direct the, uh, the beam in different directions. And this slide here shows uh, essentially three, uh, three beam angles. And uh, uh, it's uh, from uh, a picture that we'll see in the later slides. Uh, but uh, in this particular case, this is just three of uh, maybe 150 or so uh, beam angles where they're trying to investigate more of the, of the pipe wall. So uh, this would be, uh, you can take those various beam angles and stack them all up and produce a 3D cube. And uh, this is what you get. And we have uh, three uh, slices from that uh, 3D cube from the phased array imaging. Uh, the one in the lower left-hand corner would be the slice on the outside surface. And so that's uh, similar to what you would get from a magnetic particle image. And those are the cracks as they intersect the outside wall. Uh, if you go to the right there, that's uh, a, uh, uh, see on that uh, outside wall surface, you'll see two lines. There's a, a vertical line, which is a circumferential section through the crack field, and you'll see a, a, a horizontal line, which is an axial uh, uh, section through the crack field. So the circumferential section is over there on the right, and you can see these corner reflections. And uh, there's one the tip diffraction. And if you'll connect the tip diffraction back to, down to a corner refraction, or a corner reflection there, so that you go from the tip to the corner, you can kind of envision how tall that crack is. Uh, you don't actually get to see the crack, but <clears throat> you can kind of envision that it's there from the tip to the corner. And then if you look at the uh, axial section here, you can see the corner reflections, which are the small cracks, and then the one tip, which is the deeper crack. And you can kind of see a crack shape, a penny type shape there, um, kind of envision what a crack would look like from the phased array. Um, here's uh, just that uh, surface uh, section compared to mag particle, and you can see the tear cracks do line up fairly well, and uh, it does produce a fairly good image. Uh, the one thing you will notice is that the phased array image has much broader, uh, less focused uh, images of the cracks. 
and it's because the, uh, the uh, phased array is typically not focused on the surface, it's focused in the middle of the pipe wall. Uh, so it does uh, show you what the crack field will look like, but it's not uh, completely in focus at the, at the edges. So uh, moving on to ultrasonic imaging. Ultrasonic imaging is a new technique and it's uh, occurring because of advances in computers. Um, and uh, essentially ultrasonic imaging is like a little micro uh, seismic survey. So if you can take that same uh, uh, transducer that you had for phased array, but instead of phasing the elements, you fire each one individually and then record on all the receivers. And this uh, slide is trying to represent that where you're firing the first uh, little element of the transducer on the left and uh, you're recording the wave train that occurs through all the receivers there in the middle and then a plot of the data is over there on the right and uh, you can see uh, uh, what looks essentially like a little seismic shot uh, trace there on the right. Uh, the first little horizontal line is the reflection off the back wall and the second horizontal line is the reflection off the near wall from the second skip. And we'll also see some uh, con mode conversions in there, some shear wave um, and it's uh, kind of hard to point out without a laser pointer, but uh, just trust me, there's a lot of information there. So you would record that data and then you would uh, repeat this for each of the other transducers. And that's uh, what's here on the next slide. So you can see in this second row, you're firing the second element and recording all the data from the second element. And then on the bottom one uh, would be the nth transducer. Let's say if you have a 64 element transducer, this would be the 64th element and then you're recording all the data from that and you can see that this produces a little bit uh, different representation of the of the ultrasonic images that are or ultrasonic waves that are coming back um, and so uh, you can see here that this is kind of how the the name uh, full waveform capture comes about for this technique and that you're recording all of the uh, ultrasonic information from here and then we take this and we put it in the computer and we try to invert it or do a, a backward migration and determine what the actual uh, uh, material is that's in the pipe wall itself. And this uh, next slide is uh, one of the early uh, inversions of this data. This is actually uh, produced uh, by a colleague at RTD in um, Holland. He did this as part of his uh, PhD thesis back in 2007. And on the left you have a macro which uh, shows the slit that's put in the steel and in the middle you see uh, uh, the uh, inversion which is uh, a slice that's been taken uh, and you can see the back wall imaged here fairly well and you can also see the slits imaged fairly well. And if you take a whole bunch of these 2D slices and you stack them, then you can produce a 3D image and that's uh, represented here on the right. Uh, so this uh, first inversion was done uh, in computers in 2007 and uh, Niels Portschen was uh, fairly happy when he uh, was able to do this single inversion in about four or five minutes, which he thought was uh, fairly quick at that time. In uh, 2012, uh, we uh, saw this technology at Kiefner and we said uh, there's a big integrity problem here in North America and this is trying to uh, discriminate all of the features in a seam weld. So in 2012, we got a sample from one of our customers which had some hook cracks in it and we brought the um, folks over from uh, Rotterdam to, um, to try to image this and uh, produce some results that were promising enough that it was uh, worth uh, trying to pursue additional uh, research. But here you can see the hook crack. It's uh, clearly identified. It has the entire angle there. You can uh, tell it's a hook crack and not something else. Uh, you can see the uh, OD surface on the top and the ID surface on the bottom on this uh, image on the left. And there's even a tiny little hook crack there on the bottom. Uh, and it, uh, you can see uh, sort of ghosting of that to hook crack in this particular image, uh, this early image. And on the right, we have an upturned inclusion or someone, what some might call an internal hook crack that's not surface breaking. Uh, this one has some uh, cross uh, hatching uh, on it, uh, both uh, above and below. And the stuff below is very hard to see in this particular image, this early image. But this uh, essentially delimitates the uh, inclusion and tells you that it is an inclusion and it's not surface breaking and is benign. And this data was presented in a paper in uh, the Rio conference back in 2013. Um, since then, uh, DOT awarded um, RTD a contract uh, to uh, pursue this uh, uh, in more detail and uh, this is some of the first images uh, we got as a result of that uh, contract and on the left here is a uh, is a ultrasonic image of the seam without any defects in it uh, you can tell it is the seam area because of the trim issues here on the bottom of this image and on the right uh, is uh, one of our first images of lack of fusion you can see the lack of fusion is a very vertical anomaly 
Uh, you can see the X up at the outer surface. Those are the corner reflections you would get from normally from phased array. Uh, it's uh, clearly identifiable as a surface breaking uh, lack of fusion anomaly because of its vertical nature. And on the ID, you can see that there's poor trim. And so there's a little bit of an offset or a corner there. And you would see that corner from uh, one of these other uh, earlier uh, UT techniques. But here you can clearly discriminate the uh, poor trim from the lack of fusion anomaly. So it's, uh, this acoustic imaging is clearly doing a better job in terms of discrimination. Uh, here's uh, one of the later anomalies we detected. And it's actually been broken open. You can see the la uh, lack of fusion anomaly that's been uh, broken open uh, by a freeze breaking uh, in the upper left. Uh, down below is, um, is a, an oblique image of that. It's a little, it's not exactly perpendicular, but it's uh, close to perpendicular to the uh, image. And you can see it's not as deep on the left and deeper on the right, so it's a fairly reasonable image of that uh, lack of fusion. And up here in the upper uh, right, uh, we see uh, down the, include, down the uh, lack of fusion anomaly, you can see it's almost through wall. On the top, you can see the OD surface, and on the bottom, you can see the ID surface. And you can see that the vertical line is almost through wall. And you can see the crosses there. And the crosses are essentially the corner reflections that are occurring uh, as the uh, anomaly breaks the uh, surface there. So that's a pretty good image of a, of a lack of fusion anomaly. We've had uh, one opportunity to take the technique and apply it to stress corrosion cracking. Um, this is an SEC colony that uh, was a coupon that uh, is sitting in the Kiefner lab. Uh, we shipped it over to Holland and let the researchers there look at the look at it, and we can see here uh, five parallel cracks in an SEC uh, um, colony. Uh, the outside surface here is not re really well imaged, and the reason it isn't imaged is the cracks are, are essentially uh, um, providing shadowing, so the uh, ultrasonic energy is not getting out and, and, and seeing the outside surface. We can see these crosses, which are, are um, essentially the, uh, the, the corner reflections, and you can connect those. and. Uh, kind of imagine where the, uh, oh, that's the wrong one. <laughs> you can kind of imagine where the OD surface is. And so that's uh, kind of uh, what the OD surface on this uh, colony would look like. Uh, you can see the cracks here that are imaged. And uh, they're pointed out better here with the arrows. And then if we take away uh, the vertical imaging, and you can turn off various modes in this uh, technique, then you can start to just see the tips. And the tips are represented by these little X's here. And uh, we've circled them here in this slide. And so we can get very precise sizing of uh, each of the uh, cracks within the colony. So it, uh, looks, it looks promising for better sizing of, and uh, discrimination of SCC. Uh, this was an SCC uh, through wall colony, or crack colony. And uh, one of the cracks uh, went all the way through. And this is an image of this through wall crack. And you can see here that this is uh, meandering around, uh, as is uh, typical of uh, high pH SCC. And uh, the uh, various wave modes that exist in uh, ultrasonic imaging allow that uh, meandering to be imaged. Uh, so it uh, looks promising for being able to see the entire crack in a colony. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, last, I wanted to just kind of go over why is this uh, coming to fruition now. And uh, I kind of uh, gave you a timeline here that kind of spans my career. I uh, graduated from college in 1982 as a, as a, a geophysicist. Uh, not a seismologist, but I uh, got to see those guys in action. And uh, in, that, in those days, the uh, seismologists would go out to the field, and they would uh, collect these big uh, you know, tapes of data. And they would bring them back, and they would process them in a computer that was the size of a room. And it would take months to process the data and produce an image. And uh, at that time, uh, we could have applied this technology to pipelines. But quite frankly, at that time, it would have been cheaper and faster to replace the pipe than try to do ultrasonic imaging. So uh, it didn't exist in the 1980s. Uh, in 2007, as I told you earlier, Niels Portschen uh, published his PhD thesis. And at that time, he was doing signal inversions. And they were taking four to five minutes. And so if you're going to try to take a, a slice every millimeter and try to image a crack colony, that means it would take 100 minutes to uh, image uh, an inch of data. And if you wanted to image a 40-foot joint, if you're going to try to image the entire seam, it might take a month. Uh, and since then, they've uh, advanced the uh, processing speed on these, and they've gotten much faster. Uh, by the time I got involved in 2013, it was a lot faster. And even in the year I've been involved, it's uh, sped up by an order of magnitude uh, in terms of processing. So they can now process uh, 20 to 30 inversions in a second. Or in, in other words, they can produce uh, an image every millimeter for an inch in one second. So they can scan an inch per second. 
and that means that you could uh, image an entire joint in about 10 minutes uh, if they could image an entire joint without uh, filling up their data buffers. Uh, so um, uh, the uh, processing speed is getting to the point that it's no longer an issue. Instead, they can back off on maybe the processing speed and, and pay more attention to trying to do the ultrasonic imaging. And uh, lastly, just in conclusion, uh, this is sort of uh, the evolution of the technology just as uh, a recapitulation. Um, the shear wave looks for corner reflections and uh, tip diffractions, and so it's uh, really beholden on the interpreter to connect all those uh, reflections and tip diffractions and produce a middle image. Uh, the time of flight diffraction uses these uh, single transducers to try to size from the tip diffractions. And the phased array uh, was the first uh, technique that, that was uh, producing rudimentary images. And I call them rudimentary because it's only producing tip diffractions and corner reflections. Uh, and it's uh, this acoustic imaging which is evolving and uh, will probably be rolling out and uh, available in the next uh, couple of years. It's uh, going to provide uh, a lot of promise here and it, it looks like it's going to do a better job of discriminating benign anomalies from uh, defects. So benign anomalies are things like inclusions, uh, poor, poor trim, uh, very shallow lack of fusion anomalies and uh, we could be able to distinguish those from uh, defects such as uh, fatigue cracks and uh, through wall lack of fusions. And uh, it also looks like it's gonna have better imaging for SEC colonies. Our final speaker this morning is Akam Huga uh, from NDT, who is going to talk about um, pipeline crack detection technology developments. Akam. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. So I will talk about uh, our current fleet uh, of ILI inspection tools that we have available for detecting cracks. And uh, the first slide is uh, to explain quickly the measurement principle. Uh, it's actually using 45 degree shear waves. Um, you need a liquid coupling medium to, uh, to uh, with, uh, in combination with a, a piezo sensor. And uh, you're shooting on the internal surface of the pipe wall. Part of the ultrasonic beam is uh, uh, penetrating the pipe wall and uh, there with a 45 degree shear wave uh, bouncing between the internal and external surface. So if there's no crack in the pipeline, you will not have a reflected signal back. If there's a crack, then uh, you will have a reflection. Uh, and uh, as it was just explained before, uh, we mainly use the corner effect coming from the corner of that crack. Uh, in some cases, it's also possible to get a reflection from the crack tip. In that case, uh, it's even possible to make a more accurate sizing, but in most cases uh, we have this indirect uh, information from the, from the corner effect. So we can also discriminate between internal and external defect uh, based on the time of flight that the ultrasound uh, takes from, uh, from the sensor to the reflector. So, uh, basically we have two types of uh, defects that we are looking for. One is the actual cracks, that's going in the longitudinal direction of the pipeline. That's actually, I, th I would say, uh, at least 90% of the inspections that we're currently doing. But we also have a UCC tool that's looking for circ circumferential cracks. Um, the orientation of the defects must be between plus minus 10 degrees either in the uh, actual direction or in the circumferential direction, depending on the technology that we're using. We, we are detecting all the different types of uh, anomalies uh, that are associated with cracks, so SEC, fatigue cracks, uh, long seam cracks, and uh, weld anomalies. Uh, with both technologies, the, we have a minimum defect size of 30 by one, millimeter or 1.2 inches and uh, 0 0.04 inches in, in depth in the pipe body and uh, two millimeters in depth in the, at the seam weld. That, that's true for both uh, technologies. Actually the tool would be able to 
even detect smaller defects. So the sensitivity is, is very high for, for this tool. Uh, the challenge is more in the discrimination, in the data analysis of the, of the results. When we get the data back, uh, we need to discriminate between different defect types or inclusions or laminations. And if the crack is, is getting less and less uh, deep, uh, it's getting more and more difficult to discriminate it from other defect types. Uh, finally, I would like to talk about uh, depth sizing. Uh, that's something interesting uh, because we have switched in the last few months uh, from these uh, ranges that we have done in the past up to absolute values for the depth sizing. So the reason is that we think, so we're not, not doing, we don't want to say that we're doing a direct measurement now and that we have a much better accuracy today, but we think uh, it's fitting better to the challenges that we have, especially for the, especially for the, uh, for the uh, remaining lifetime calculations and all the assessment that has to be done afterwards, it's very helpful to have a, a, a discrete value instead of a, a range. Uh, regarding depth sizing, I think we have uh, learned a lot in the, in the, in the last years, uh, especially from dig verification results. So we're using uh, all the dig verification results that we have had from the past and try to implement that in our data analysis rules. So which defect types uh, uh, lead to a certain amount of, of uh, energy that is reflected back uh, and, and looking at the position of a defect, looking at the orientation of a defect, all this has influences on the depth sizing. And with the large amount of data that we meanwhile have available, we are getting more and more uh, accurate with the depth sizing, but on the other hand, on the other hand, it's still not a, a direct measurement. That must be clear. Okay. Uh, in the next slides, I would like to show some examples of of defects where we have made uh, significant improvements in in the past years as well. Things that we would not have detected uh, at all or in a, in a, in a way that we not, not have reported it correctly. Uh, and today we have uh, a lot of improvements in that area. Uh, the first example on the left side is uh, a very short defect. So I mentioned before uh, we could, the tool is detecting more than we are specifying. Uh, the tool is detecting also smaller defects from length and even from depth. And the challenge here is on the, on the uh, data analysis side. So to really uh, find out if this is really a defect, uh, a crack defect or something else. So we have improved our data analysis rules. Also in regard, for example, for the who cracks in ERW. Um, so we have an, a good understanding uh, that uh, from, for example, here from the clockwise and from the counterclockwise sensors, we will have different results, different uh, signals, and that allows us today uh, to, to discriminate between a uh, uh, lack of fusion, for example, and a hook rack in, in the ERW world. Um, another example here is a, a crack a longitudinal crack in the longitudinal weld in the middle. This is a desaw weld and uh, that's just challenging as well. Uh, you see uh, the dig verification results showed after the grinding that this crack is uh, going into the base material or into the uh, part which is uh, even to the base material of the longitudinal weld. And uh, this is a very challenging defect to detect with an ILI tool. Um, so we have to apply different data analysis rules here. If we just use the normal data analysis rules, we will probably not detect this type of defect or we will undercall it So uh, from, from the depth. So uh, this is a lot of experience that we gathered in the past that allows us today to uh, make a better reporting on, on this type of defect. 
another one ex uh, interesting example is SCC at, at Girthwells. We have had uh, several pipelines where we had SCC only in the vicinity of Girthwells. And that's actually the most difficult or most challenging area uh, to detect such type of defects. Um, we also have established special not only special analysis rules, but also uh, optimization on the, on the design part of the sensor carrier to ensure that even in this difficult area we are able to, to, make a, uh, to get good signals that are usable for data analysis and at the end making a, a good judgment of the size and the length of this type of defect and also of course for the discrimination of other defect types. Another challenging thing is uh, detecting cracks or crack fields in dents. So it's not so easy to uh, recognize here, but on the left side you see this is a pipeline or a pipe with a, with a dent. And within this dent uh, a crack field was uh, generated. Uh, same thing, a few years ago it was very challenging for us and I'm not saying that today we can find all of them, but we have made a, a lot of progress in uh, discriminating real crack fields in dents from other indications that could have been caused by this dent. And uh, we have uh, actually a lot of uh, examples where we detected crack fields and single cracks in dents. So finally, another example here is uh, for circumferential crack, uh, cracks. We have a crack field here. Uh, we have um, not only crack fields that can be detected with the UCC tool, but also uh, cracks in the girth welds. Uh, I don't have a lot of uh, nice pictures from that, but uh, we have detected that already in the past as well. And uh, SCC, is occurring also in circumferential direction under certain con uh, conditions uh, and, and this is a very nice example here to, to show that the tool is capable to detect this type of defect. So finally, so this technology is already several years old and uh, uh, NDT Global is at the moment in a situation to go into the next generation of uh, crack detection technology. We are investing uh, now a lot in the next generation. And uh, the main development goal for this next uh, upcoming tool is to even increase the probability of detection for significant defects, but also for all the, of the other defects, of course. Um, further improve the sizing and discrimination capabilities. I think that's the, the really the key. Uh, we want to have a, as accurate as possible sizing for, the, for cracks and, uh, and also the discrimination to say this really is an SEC and it's not a, a lamination or it's not a single crack or it's, uh, it's uh, not a mill anomaly or something that's uh, very important. Uh, another uh, development goal, of course, is to enhance the tool reliability and, uh, and uh, another one is really also focus on, on the software part. Uh, we want to additionally, as a, as a quality improvement uh, method, uh, automize our, our quality checks more and more to have a double check on, on each feature that is going to the client. So with the information that we have currently in our database about all the different defects, the thousands and millions of, of defects that we have about the, 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 the different inspections, we want to have access on that with the software and compare it with the actual features. So if there is any outlier or any inconsistency within the data, we want to compare these results um, with the actual feature and at least highlight the analyst and tell the analyst here it looks like there's a discrepancy. Look, this was a feature looking very similar in the past uh, from a different uh, inspection run. 
or from the same inspection run, and there's a discrepancy here. Review this uh, feature and uh, have another look at it. So this uh, is one thing that we want to implement in this new generation uh, as well. Yeah, so implementation strategy is uh, to have this tool available in about 18 months. So that's the plan that we're currently uh, following and, uh, and applying, of course, all the historical uh, know-how that we have so far and, and leverage from that. So that's mainly it. Thank you very much. We are having time for just a couple of questions um, <laughs> before lunch. Um, we have one off the webcast for uh, for Brian, um, talking about the how challenging is it to measure the toughness of ERW seams, um, kind of looking at notch placement, how many specimens you would need to take, etc. Good question. Um, is this on? Lights on. It should be. It's not. The, the light doesn't go off. It's on. Okay. Um, we'll, have a go, we'll have a go at answering that. Um, if, if you think about a standard Sharpie test uh, and the number of replicates that you need and the temperature range that you need to cover, basically what you're doing is a, a similar set of experiments in, in a series of locations. Uh, and uh, those locations involve uh, placement with respect to the bond line placement with respect to the haze or the upset area, placement with respect to the body. The body's easy, the haze is easy, or the upset's easy. The hard one is the bond line, and, and basically what you need to do is make sure that you locate uh, the notch such that it interrogates the bond line, and then after the fact, you need to use microscopy to verify the fact that what you thought would happen actually happens, and if you do that, you limit the scatter and, and likewise limit the number of replicates that you need. Any questions in the room here? And again, if you could state your name and who you're with, that's really helpful because um, for those of you who aren't up here, the lights we're using for the webcast are bright enough that we <laughs> cannot see past the second row. Just saying. Sounds safe. Good idea. Uh, <laughs> Joe Kernicki, Exxon Mobil. I've got a question for Harvey about in the ditch work. Um, I think we really rely on the in the ditch work, the UT work to um, gain confidence in the pipeline inspection results and determine what the truth is, so to speak. Um, when I looked at some joint industry program results of uh, UT work with uh, multi-zone and fully automated systems, it seems like the probability of detection of even those high-end systems don't quite meet the specification of ILI tools, which is a bit of an interesting point. But where I'm going with that, Harvey, is do you see the need to do any performance demonstration or performance qualification of the in-the-ditch operators so that we better understand what the quote-unquote truth is? Yeah, I, I think that's the case. Uh, I, I've heard uh, some same sentiments from others that uh, some people think that uh, some of the ILI tools are actually performing better than the in-the-ditch technologies. So it kind of negates this ability to qualify your ILI tool with your in-ditch tools. Um, it's uh, one of the reasons I uh, have uh, hope for uh, ultrasonic imaging because it will take out some of the training and qualification needs for that technician who's in the ditch uh, making the measurements. Um, it will uh, take some of the knowledge that the inspector needs to connect uh, the tip to the corner reflection and say that's a crack and uh, essentially uh, put it in the computer and the computer can connect the dots and produce an image. So uh, yeah, I think there are problems. I've heard of uh, lack of qualified phased array technicians, uh, shortage. Uh, so uh, yeah, there are problems with in-ditch uh, tools for qualifying ILI. John O'Brien, Chevron. So following on from that and looking at the work 
that's being done. Uh, what are you doing to actually look at the reference and qualification standards for setting up the UT in the first place? And are the standards you're currently employing taking that you're now using multiple angles and sophisticated processing adequate for sizing properly? Uh, well, that, that question kind of seems to uh, go over two uh, spans. One is uh, what's kind of being done for qualification of current uh, technicians, and uh, the standards for qualifying those are, are really the uh, um, ASNT standards for qualifying uh, technicians, and they get level one, level two, and level three qualifications. Um, some people question whether those qualifications actually equate into uh, improved performance in the ditch. Um, and I, I really don't know enough about that to uh, comment on that more than just to say I've heard questions about that ability to qualify. In, in terms of the research project, uh, our, our goal is to uh, make measurements and then qualify the measurements on how well we're doing by breaking the samples open and uh, producing results. We, we have some statistical results on uh, sizing accuracy on our very first tests uh, that I didn't have time to show, but uh, it's our plan to uh, continue doing that as we go forward and improve the uh, inversion algorithms. Any further questions before lunch? Right. Alan? Okay. Um, with the lunch time now, just wanted to let you know we have uh, so far on the webcast, we got as high as 440, so it's pretty good turnout there. Really good. Uh, and then we have a, about 180 here. So thanks again for all of you that have tuned in by webcast. And again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to submit them online. There's a way to do that.